Good morning to all of you. And uh, uh, on behalf of ECFRAG, I welcome you all to this outreach event organized jointly with Business Europe and the IASB. This is part of the joint uh, EFRAG IASB outreach program on this, the IASB exposure draft disclosure requirements in IFRSs, a pilot approach which proposes an innovative approach to standard setting for disclosure and also proposes amendments to IFRS 13 and IAS 19. It's nice to see so many registrants to this event, and this confirms the importance of what the ISB is trying to achieve with this project. This is an innovative approach, so it is key, key to test and have evidence from preparers. So it's important today to have with us Business Europe, as this is dedicated to preparers, to their perspective, to listen at the, the challenges they encountered when testing these proposals. So speaking uh, uh, um, about uh, uh, preparers, uh, I hand over to Bertrand Perrin, a member of the IASB and former uh, preparer. Thank you again for joining us, and I wish you all a fruitful discussion. Thank you, Chiara. Um, I'm Bertrand Perrin, a member, uh, board member at the IASB, and I'm very pleased to be here uh, uh, and to uh, be able to listen to what uh, 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 European stakeholders uh, um, will uh, tell us about what they've learned uh, uh, throughout the process. I would like first to thank uh, uh, Chiara and uh, EFRAG for having assisting uh, IASB alongside uh, the uh, uh, outreach on our disclosure initiative project. I would like also to, to remind you all uh, that uh, this uh, disclosure initiative project is first of all an internal uh, uh, project at ISB, but uh, and this probably shows the importance that we have uh, put on this project. We have wished to uh, seek the views of uh, uh, our stakeholders in all jurisdictions. And uh, with the help of EFRAG, we have been able to discuss with many European uh, stakeholders, preparers, uh, auditors, users, and it has been uh, uh, incredibly helpful for Catherine uh, Dunkersley uh, and the staff uh, in uh, um, uh, receiving feedbacks to some of our proposals. And of course, as Chiara mentioned, I'm a former preparer, so I'm very happy that so many European preparers participated uh, to this uh, uh, outreach, and I thank them a lot for their input, uh, which is very precious for the team and for us and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. And I hand over to uh, Klaas. I think it's your turn. Thank you very much, Bertrand. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Klaus Norberg. I'm the chair of the Business Europe Sounding Board, and it's a great pleasure for me to be the, be, uh, the moderator for this webinar this morning. Um, let me give a brief overview of what we're going to do here at the webinar. Uh, we're going to go through the proposals and explaining to what also has done during the field tests from the ISB and also F from EFRAG side and also what other events um, EFRAG has participated in. Um, uh, let me start by introducing the presenters and also uh, a very distinguished panel that we have with us today to discuss the, the outcome of the field test and their experiences. First of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Catherine Donkersley. She's an ISB with the ISB technical staff, and she will be here to explain the objectives of the joint field test and also explain the approaches that have been taken in the exposure draft. Uh, also with us today is Catherine Schöne. She is an EFRAG project director, and she's here to explain um, EFRAG's outreach activities and the workshops established with companies. Uh, also presenting from uh, EFRAG is Fredria Ferreira. She's an EFRAG senior technical manager, and she will also be here to outline some of the key themes identified in the field tests. Um, let me then turn to, to the panel. I'm, I'm very happy to introduce um, uh, the following uh, panelists. First of all, I'd like to introduce Pierre-Henri Damotte. He's the head of accounting public affairs at Société Générale. With us, we also have Lars Hammers. 
He's a technical accounting and report expert at Royal DSM. Also participating in the panel is Maren Polman Klein. She's a senior vice president, corporate accounting principal standard, standards at Deutsche Post. With us is also Martin Switek. He's a member of the EFRAG Financial Instruments Working Group and an IFRS expert at Erste Group. Those are with the panel to bring perspectives from the preparer side. Also giving an auditor's perspective on the issues that we will discuss today is Sylvie Coppes. She's an EFRAG TAG member uh, working for KPMG. Also uh, regarding the proposed amendments regarding IS-19, I'm happy to that we can bring an actuary's perspective and that will be given by Gert Ridder, and he's a consulting actuary. Last but not least, uh, it's also happy that we can give a user's perspective in this panel discussion, and that will be brought by Kasim Raswi, and he's an independent analyst. Also, I'd like to introduce uh, Niklas Grieb. He's the EFRAG TEG Vice Chair and the Head of Regulatory Strategies at Svenska Handelsbanken. Um, Niklas will uh, do some closing remarks and, and also reflect on the main takeaways from this uh, webinar uh, session today. And Niklas will also um, keep an eye on questions that will be brought forward by you in the audience. Uh, we will then open up for some Q&As in each of the sessions. Um, with that introduction, I would like to give the, the word to um, Catherine Donkersley to, to first uh, uh, explain um, the, the objectives of this proposal and what you have done so far. And after that, I will also let Katrine come in and explain uh, what EFRAG has done so far. Please, Catherine. <laughs> Thank you very much and good morning everybody. It's a great pleasure to join you today. Um, so what, what we're going to be doing over the course of the webinar is talking through the, the three big aspects to the board's recent exposure draft on disclosure. So that's a new approach that the IASB has proposed to disclosure requirements and then the testing of that approach on two standards being IFRS 13 fair value measurement and IAS 19 employee benefits. Um, but before we get into the, the first of those three topics, which is the approach, uh, we thought we'd start by just summing up the, the fieldwork we've done and its importance and the approach we've taken to that. So as Chiara and Bertrand have both already indicated this morning, uh, these proposals, if, if finalised, would lead to a big change in the way that all of us think about and approach disclosures. We've had years of feedback from all stakeholders about the need to improve the usefulness of financial statement disclosures. And if we are to achieve that, then it will require everyone involved in financial reporting to work together and play their part. So for that reason, it has been incredibly important for the IASB to get feedback on how its proposals would apply in practice. And that's really where the fieldwork exercise we've been working on comes in. So what we did was ask companies to apply the proposals for either or both of the two test cases and share with us what their resulting disclosure note would look like and then fill in a questionnaire or talk to us about their experiences. So we were looking for things like how companies would go about applying the judgment required by the proposals whether the proposals would really achieve their goal of more useful, more relevant information for investors, and things like whether there would be any practical consequences or costs that the IASB had not already thought about. Now, in terms of the, the global picture on the field work, we still have uh, some companies coming in with their results right now. Um, but across the world, once this is complete, we are anticipating having uh, around 50 field work participants in total. And those companies cover a, a wide range of jurisdictions and industries. So we've had an enormous amount of really useful feedback and um, as you may hear today, there, there has been a mixture of views expressed. 
What you're going to hear over the course of the webinar is a few examples from European companies that took part in that very large exercise and a discussion about their fieldwork outcomes. And what we'll be doing early next year is reporting the findings from all fieldwork participants to the IASB, and that's going to form an important piece of input as the board starts to think about how to move forward. Um, but before we get into to part one of the proposals, uh, I think I'm going to, to turn to the other Catherine to share a bit more about the European specific fieldwork approach. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I would like to give you a short overview about the uh, participants in Europe. So on uh, slide five, you can see um, who participated in the field test in Europe. So we had as well a wide range of industries covered and uh, a wide range of jurisdictions were involved in uh, field testing the proposals. Um, there were eight financial institutions, um, three real estate companies and several other um, industries. Many of them did uh, mock disclosures and uh, some of them gave us limited uh, input by um, sending us a questionnaire or um, um, having detailed interviews with us. What we saw is that um, the smaller entities were underrepresented in the field test. For those, we developed a different approach. We developed a survey and had interviews with their auditors to get insights from uh, how the smaller entities would react on the proposed approach and how they could deal with these proposals. Uh, for the field test result, we will shortly um, publish a report about the workshops. So we had, in addition to this detailed field work that the, um, was um, requested from the ISB, we organized uh, three workshops between the field test participants where they could discuss their field uh, test result amongst them. And this was incredible valuable for us that we uh, could understand it even a bit better. And this discussion um, brought some new things um, on the table. And uh, thank you for this. And we will publish a report about it. Based on this, we had discussions as well with users and with auditors afterwards. And some of the field test participants allowed us to share their field test results with auditors and with um, users. So on the next slide, you can see um, some more outreach activities, what we did. Um, so I would like to highlight this um, point, the last point, which is related to the small and medium enterprises. So for that, we will uh, publish as part um, of our tech papers next week. We will upload a um, report about the result from the small and medium-sized entities. We had the 45 responses, and I think that's uh, really valuable input from preparers as well. With that, um, I uh, would like to hand back to, to, to Klaus. And I think go then to the general approach. Thank you very much. Then we start the first session of the webinar today with the general approach. And, and I, I will give the word to Catherine to explain the approach that the ISP has taken. Please, Catherine. Thank you. Um, OK, so before we get uh, into the very important matter of hearing from today's panellists, I am going to just take a few minutes to give you a, a very high level reminder of the, the key points to do with the proposed approach that we've been testing um, and a flavour of the big picture messages coming out of the field work. So the proposed approach to disclosures would rely on disclosure objectives and move away from prescriptive requirements to disclose particular items of information. So for each topic, the IASB would develop a number of detailed, specific disclosure objectives that explain user information needs and require companies to provide information that enables those needs to be met. 
Now, each of those objectives would be supplemented with items of information that in most, not all, but most cases would be explicitly described as not mandatory. In other words, the compliance test would be, have you met the objective rather than have you disclosed a particular item of information? Now, it's important to keep in mind that this approach really came about in direct response to a huge amount of stakeholder feedback about why disclosures today are not as useful as they might be and requests for the IASB to develop disclosure requirements in a way that would help companies and others to address the issues. Essentially, what we heard was that in practice, disclosure requirements in the standards are often applied as though they are a checklist. However, that's not really the way it's supposed to work um, because IAS1 already requires a company to apply materiality across all financial statement disclosures. So, for example, disclosing material information, even if that information is not explicitly named in the prescriptive disclosure requirements of a standard, and also not disclosing anything that's immaterial, even if that is mentioned. But what we're told is that that very important materiality overlay is not always happening. We've also heard that stakeholders don't always understand the point of particular disclosures, i.e. why users want the information. And if they don't understand that, then with the best will in the world, applying those good materiality judgments and disclosing the most useful information can be challenging. So the proposed approach aims to address all of that. The proposals put user needs right there in the disclosure objectives, including explanatory details about what users actually want to do with the information provided. One very important point to highlight is that the board is not expecting individual companies to talk to their own users and come up with disclosures that would satisfy every user need in the world. Um, indeed, it is the board's job to identify the common user information needs that financial reporting is aiming to satisfy and get those needs into the requirements of the standards. So instead, the compliance requirement is to provide information that enables the user needs described in the disclosure objectives to be met. That focus on objectives rather than prescriptive requirements reinforces at an individual standard level the existing requirement that materiality should be applied across all financial statement disclosures. The idea is that the disclosure objectives give companies what they've told us they need to apply good judgment and disclose only that information that's genuinely relevant. Now, of course, that approach will only be effective if the disclosure objectives provide a sound basis to determine what needs to be disclosed. And really, the fieldwork has been very much about working with companies to explore practical application and see if that has been achieved in the two test cases. So probably the first thing to say about what we found is that just about everyone who has taken part in the fieldwork exercise likes the disclosure objectives, primarily because they do allow that understanding of what users want and importantly, why they want it. I mentioned earlier, however, that we got a mixture of views, and that mixture really relates to the level of prescriptiveness in the items of information that follow the objectives. So some of our fieldwork participants really supported the approach taken in the ED, and they thought that the move away from a perceived checklist enabled them to disclose more useful information. And in fact, some of those companies told us that they plan to implement the financial reporting improvements coming out of the exercise in their next annual report without waiting for the project to conclude. 
At the other end of the scale, we had companies that were concerned about losing those more prescriptive requirements. Uh, you'll hear from some of those companies during this session, so I won't go into too much detail, um, but at a very high level, those participants were concerned about practical matters such as audit and questioned whether it would be possible to apply the level of judgment needed and demonstrate and justify that they had satisfied the disclosure objective in each case. We also had a lot of opinion between those two extremes, companies that saw the benefit of the proposals but had suggestions about ways to address the practical concerns identified. So overall, we've had a lot of really interesting feedback, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing a lot more about it from today's panellists. Um, and with that, I will uh, hand back over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. I'm now turning to Katrin. Maybe you can explain uh, some of the key themes that EFRAG has found during the field tests so far. Thank you very much, Claes. Um, on uh, slide eight, we would like to, to uh, remind you a bit uh, to what we had in the draft comment letter. So FRAC supported uh, the objective of the project and uh, welcomed um, the, the, the development of uh, methodology uh, to come up with a better disclosure requirements. Um, to test this approach uh, was really uh, one of the key things that we thought uh, is necessary and useful to develop these um, disclosure requirements. The, to, to focus on the user needs is one of the important aspects in, in, in the project, and uh, that is really appreciated by EFRAC. And with that, um, we thought that we addressed in the draft comment letter already that uh, the materiality concept might need to be improved to come up with better conclusions about what has to be disclosed. So such a project has to be um, supported by a very well-developed materiality concept. Um, we addressed in the draft comment letter concern about digital reporting because uh, digital um, re reporting requires comparable and consistent reporting, and therefore we addressed this topic in the draft comment letter. Now I would like to come on slide, slide nine um, to the key question that was raised in our draft comment letter, and that was, uh, are objectives really enough? Or, or is it is necessary to have um, some disclosure requirements really uh, mandated and not only um, that we do not only have the objectives. Uh, this question was uh, discussed between the field test participants and as well um, during several outreach events. So, um, now I would like to highlight the outcome of the field work. So as I said, we have uh, 22 field test participants and we try to reflect with this panel uh, these most of, of, of the different views that we heard during our discussion with the field test participants. So we hope that uh, you get a really good insight on um, based on the today's discussion as we try to reflect uh, several different views in this panel already. So the outcome of the field test is that we saw limited and targeted changes in the disclosures provided um, to us. Um, so there was some information added, some information, existing information was enriched. We saw the exclusion of specific information and specifically from the financial institutions, we saw several restructurings of the financial information. Um, the participants started with their existing disclosures. Only one company uh, really started to prepare new disclosures. Most of them uh, just uh, tried to, to um, change the existing information based on the objectives, how they understood them. 
The participants did not have a specific dialogue with the users. They relied on the uh, questions that they received during analyst calls, and um, based on that, they tried to, to improve their disclosures according to the objectives. All, now I come to the positive aspects, all um, participants um, appreciated to have uh, the objectives. So the objectives give structure and they um, make the requirements more understandable. So it's easier for the participants um, to decide which information is important and which one is appropriate to, to fulfill the disclosure requirements. This objectives can help as well to um, have a better discussion with the auditors. The objectives were considered being understandable and um, the information um, could be enriched wherever specific, uh, on the next slide, uh, please. Um, uh, so the information could be um, enriched uh, and, and adopted for specific circumstances. So entity-specific information uh, could be added, and it helps as well to evaluate the importance of each of the requirements and the disclosures included in the uh, notes. So it helps to focus on the important things. The Financial institutions uh, addressed it that the, um, this project is a chance for having a dialogue with the regulators. At the moment, they have the feeling that they have sometimes to disclose irrelevant information uh, because it's required by the regulator. And they think by um, having this good structure and good objectives, um, it is helpful to have an open dialogue with the regulators about disclosure requirements and how they should be applied. So now I come to, to some more critical points. The approach requires um, a higher level of judgment and it will lead to more subjectivity. That mean, might mean that the um, financial statements are less comparable between uh, the reporting entities. So you might not have the easy comparability with your peers. The non-mandatory uh, items of information um, might become a new checklist. So. The ISB has provided uh, to, beside the disclosure objectives, uh, some items of information that could be useful to fulfill the information needs by the users, but this could be treated as a new checklist. The preparers addressed us that this approach might be challenging from an operational point of view, um, and some of them requested more guidance. Large groups um, told us that uh, it's necessary to collect the information from the subsidiaries and um, the judgment cannot apply it on group level, so it requires to collect um, all this information uh, before you can apply the judgment. So on the next slide, you can see that um, we had as well in focus the costs of the proposals. The preparers in general did not identify fundamental changes to their systems and processes. However, they um, thought that additional discussion with the auditors and the enforcement bodies might be necessary. So this might bring additional costs. Um, some of a uh, few of the field test uh, participants did not anticipate difficulties with the auditors, but uh, several ones did. And um, I think that's as well um, a point of how um, the uh, materiality concept is already applied by the companies. This 
approach, uh, as we said, reply, uh, requires um, the application of judgment. The judgment involved needs to be documented, and such documentation might imply more costs. As I said before, the uh, large entities um, told us it's necessary to collect all this information from the subsidiaries, and that might mean that they, you have uh, costs from um, collecting all this information. So that I come to um, the major question, which is what is the best way to go forward? So I would say that um, we had really an open discussion at the end of each workshop about what the best way is to go forward. And several participants requested um, to have minimum disclosure requirements. Um, a few of them, uh, of, of the participants uh, in the workshops uh, told us that they uh, really like, um, or some told us that they uh, like the, the ISB approach, and um, a few of them even told, said that the uh, list of items of information might not be uh, required, that uh, it can be really enough to, to um, come up with only disclosure objective, but this was a clear minority. What we heard um, from the smaller ones, uh, I focused here in the feedback that we had from the large entities participating in the field test. So, um, but I would like to highlight here one point that we had um, heard from, from the smaller entities. From the smaller entities, we heard clearly that they would prefer uh, some minimum disclosure requirements. For them, this is more operational and uh, easier to use. So 87% uh, of the smaller entities uh, responded yes, they would like to have, in addition to the objectives, uh, some minimum disclosure requirements. With um, the users, I told you that we had talked to the users as well. So um, the users highlighted that they would like to have comparability. And um, this to, to compare entities and as well to compare entities over different periods. They appreciated the um, introduction of the objectives, but um, minimum disclosure requirements for several of the users, uh, it was uh, considered being useful. The Entity-specific information that is encouraged by this approach is something that the users uh, appreciated, and they think that's uh, um, uh, a good direction that the approach is taking. Um, what the users discussed is that uh, some of the entities will uh, come up with financial statements where you have only the minimum disclosure requirements included. So that's something that they uh, said that could be a downside of the approach, that uh, by uh, requiring only um, a minimum of, of disclosures, then some companies might read it as that is needed and nothing else. And that would be not um, a good approach. So they uh, encouraged uh, to have better guidance on the application of materiality. And um, some of the users uh, said that uh, there could be best practices and observed over time, and that there could be a kind of iterative process, what should be required and what uh, should be in the included in the minimum disclosure list. From the auditors, we got uh, feedback as well. So uh, from the auditors, um, they see a um, list of minimum disclosure requirements um, as a better basis for auditability and enforceability. Um, and they gave us feedback as well that they think that the preparers have with that a better um, basis for their operational processes, and this, this could be more efficient. Um, they addressed as well the comparability issues. 
that some core disclosures are useful to have a certain level of comparability. And entity-specific disclosures can be added um, to, to reflect the important things. Um, they reminded us uh, to, to other standards where it uh, might be useful to have a look on. This was IFRS 16. And then um, the auditors as well um, told us that more guidance on material judgment could be useful. With that, I hand over to Klaus. Thank you very much, Katrin. And now let's turn to the panel to, to get the view. So the panel is here and uh, we have prepared some questions for you. Uh, and the first question I would like to, to first address to Pierre Henri. Uh, and uh, that is, what was your ex general experience around the exposure draft? Uh, were the proposed objectives helpful when preparing uh, the disclosure on the new approach? And do you think that the uh, requirements are understandable? Good morning to all the audience attending this uh, webinar, and thank you to, to IFRAG, ISB, and, and Business Europe for, for the invitation. Uh, regarding our general experience uh, of the field test exercise, I would say, first of all, that we were waiting to the board's proposal with a very positive expectation since the project uh, was aimed to improve the effectiveness and usefulness of disclosure and uh, such objectives are fitting very well with our own policy regarding the clarity and the understandability and pedagogical aspects that we try to enhance in our own financial statements for many years. Having said that, we welcome the, uh, the introduction of uh, disclosure objectives, both overall and specific objectives, because they bring, we think, useful information for preparers about the user's needs, and it can help us to, um, to understand what is required, what is needed, but also uh, it may help us to, uh, to choose what additional information may be uh, useful to, for the correct understanding of, the, of our performance and financial situation. This is the, the, the most positive aspect of, uh, of our uh, experience around the, the, the proposal. But unfortunately, uh, at the end of the field test, when contemplating uh, the mock disclosure that we have built, we were, we were quite disappointed, except the, the specifically new items required by the, by the exposure draft. All the other provisions of the exposure draft led to quite similar disclosure as what is currently disclosed today in our financial statements. Considering, from, for instance, our financial activities, all the while not mandatory information uh, proposed for IFRS 13, fair value measurement, uh, becomes quite uh, mandatory for us falling back to the current equivalent to checklist approach. And on top of that, we did not identify a strong appetite from auditors, from our auditors, for this new approach requiring more judgment. And of course, it does not encourage us to significantly depart from the current approach. So to sum up, I would say a disappointed hope, which does not halter our willingness to improve uh, our own disclosures. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre Henri, for those views. Uh, let, let's turn to, to Martin Switek uh, to hear what your thoughts are. Uh, thank you, uh, Klaas. Uh, so, uh, yeah, well, we uh, quite uh, welcomed uh, this uh, uh, principle or objective-based uh, 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 approach. Uh, uh, these new objectives uh, were included uh, uh, in the fair value uh, note uh, in those uh, mock uh, disclosures, uh, and uh, the note uh, was structured uh, around uh, those uh, uh, objectives. Uh, and uh, uh, a preparation uh, of this note uh, was not uh, so much uh, burdensome, uh, since uh, the examples of uh, 
non-monetary non disclosures uh, in the proposed uh, requirements uh, largely overlap uh, with the existing uh, requirements uh, of uh, uh, IFRS uh, uh, 13. Uh, so. Um, we don't consider this as a downside uh, of uh, uh, the proposal uh, that uh, we, uh, regarding uh, quantitative disclosures, uh, we didn't come to a, a very much different uh, conclusion. Uh, but uh, as regards the qualitative disclosures, uh, uh, this uh, exercise uh, led us uh, to significant uh, improvements uh, in the way how uh, we would uh, present the information uh, based on these uh, proposed uh, requirements. Uh, so uh, we also consider beneficial that uh, we did not uh, have to start from a blank sheet of uh, paper when uh, preparing uh, these uh, uh, disclosures. Uh, and uh, it uh, also enables uh, to improve uh, the current uh, annual uh, uh, report uh, uh, because uh, this uh, exercise can largely be uh, used also in that uh, regard. Thank, thank you very much, Martin. And now I would like to turn to Marin to hear your views. Uh, Thank you, Klaas, yeah, and thanks uh, for inviting me today and giving me the opportunity to providing you with our feedback. Um, so the participating in the field test gave us uh, uh, an opportunity to talk to our financial instruments and pension experts and have a fresh look yeah, at the disclosure requirements, which, which was really an interesting um, discussion we had. So in general, um, we support, of course, the ISB's intention to to solve the disclosure overload or disclosure problem, as it's sometimes called. So I must admit that we are always, when there's a new standard, we are complaining about additional disclosures and so on. And therefore, of course, we will get, welcome this uh, opportunity or this intention. Um, we also see a positive aspect that on the objective that to provide more entity-specific disclosures and avoid only general uh, or so-called boilerplate disclosures. So we uh, agree on that as well. Um, but when we when we try to apply the new requirements, um, we found out on one hand that we are already, of course, applying the materiality concept and therefore we do, from our perspective, don't have any uh, relevant disclosures in our annual report. So we, at the end, after all the discussions and analysis we did, we did not, we decided to not prepare mock disclosures because we found out that there won't be any changes to what we already are disclosing. So, um, as I said, maybe as a result from what we did is that we have doubts that the proposed approach really will solve the disclosure problem. Thank you, thank you, Marin. Uh, turning to, to Lars Hammers, um, what was your experience? Thank you, Klaas, and uh, also thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, panel discussion. So, indeed, in line with the views that have been expressed uh, so far, I would say that in general, uh, the, the general objective of this disclosure initiative uh, by uh, of providing more useful information by moving from these uh, uh, prescriptive disclosure requirements to the more descriptive uh, disclosure uh, requirements was indeed very welcomed. Yeah? Yet, indeed, uh, when at this very moment, we already apply some materiality perspective in determining what disclosures are relevant to our users, and by doing so, also try to limit indeed uh, these boilerplate disclosures. So ultimately, uh, we also ended up with yeah, similar disclosures that we would derive under the, the proposed guidance as the disclosures that we currently already have. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Lars. Uh, a follow-up question uh, then to, to the first general question is, of course, if there were any areas that you found uh, challenging when, when going through the exposure draft and trying to apply the principles uh, in, the, in the exposure draft. Uh, so what are your thoughts, Martin, on this? Did you encounter any challenges? 
Yeah, so uh, considering uh, what uh, I said uh, before, application of uh, this proposed uh, requirement uh, for the mock disclosure uh, purposes was not particularly uh, challenging uh, uh, for uh, us uh, because uh, yeah, we largely uh, used uh, existing uh, quantitative uh, disclosures uh, because, as I have said, uh, the requirements uh, for non-mandatory disclosures, they largely uh, overlap uh, uh, with uh, what is currently uh, required in uh, IFRS uh, 13. So we applied a materiality uh, judgment uh, for uh, these disclosures, uh, the existing ones, and we came uh, to a conclusion that, the, yes, they would be also uh, relevant in this more uh, principle-based uh, uh, environment. Uh, we know that this proposal is very much focused uh, on a user, uh, users' uh, needs, but uh, uh, to be frank, uh, we are not challenged by our users uh, regarding uh, our uh, fair value uh, note, uh, so we also consider that uh, this uh, meets uh, their uh, needs. Uh, and so uh, uh, we uh, don't consider this uh, as uh, harmful that we uh, just uh, used uh, what has uh, worked uh, uh, so far. And uh, regarding the judgments, uh, for the mock uh, disclosures, uh, the most difficult uh, area uh, was uh, uh, to decide uh, whether the alternative fair value measurement disclosures uh, would uh, also be uh, relevant uh, for uh, level uh, two. We decided to provide uh, these only for the level three, three disclosures uh, uh, as we uh, do currently, but this will be uh, the topic uh, which, we'll, uh, which we will discuss uh, more. Uh, uh, still uh, today. So we consider uh, that uh, these uh, principle-based uh, requirements uh, would uh, uh, provide a, a better environment uh, uh, to uh, perform any changes uh, in uh, the fair value note uh, uh, for the uh, future. And I'm uh, saying this uh, uh, despite the fact that we uh, didn't uh, change much uh, uh, in the existing uh, fair value uh, note, uh, yeah, but we restructured it uh, significantly, but uh, there was hardly uh, any uh, new information uh, uh, there. But uh, if the need arises uh, in the future uh, to uh, bring some other uh, disclosures or to reduce the disclosures, uh, this is uh, a much uh, better uh, environment uh, uh, to uh, achieve that and to provide uh, reasons uh, uh, for uh, it. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, in such a uh, more uh, principle and objective environment, uh, uh, also uh, the respective parties, uh, I mean uh, auditors, uh, uh, preparers, uh, uh, and uh, uh, regulators uh, will uh, have to uh, learn uh, better uh, how to uh, uh, how to work uh, in this uh, new uh, environment uh, uh, because uh, based uh, on the existing uh, experience uh, early uh, auditors uh, um, I prefer the checklist approach which is not a surprise uh, but uh, hopefully such requirements which would teach uh, all of us uh, yeah how to depart uh, from this approach and in this regards uh, some uh, guidance uh, from the ISB uh, side how to uh, apply the materiality judgments in this area uh, would also be helpful in our view. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, Maren, uh, do you yep. think that there are any challenges or, or um, with this yep. proposal? Yes, I think so. So from our perspective, uh, the new approach will lead to, to more discussions we expect with, with our auditors and also with enforcers. And um, also at each balance sheet date, because with a, there needs to be new assessment yeah, at each balance sheet date um, regarding certain, certain disclosure requirements. So, um, and I, I think we are going to talk about these alternative fair values uh, later on, but however, we think there's a lot of judgment and more judgment even included in certain disclosures than, than maybe today. And therefore, of course, judgment, this is leads to more discussions. And that's what we said. So, as I said, um, it, 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 this is, I think, the main challenge for us. Yeah. So we, we see um, that, that there is going to be um, more discussions, we think, more documentation requirements and discussions with auditors and enforcers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
interesting. Uh, Lars, uh, what is your your view on this? I think that in general, the, the approach and the objective of the disclosure initiative were, were very clear. I think that the, the main challenge, so to say, that we uh, that we experienced was how indeed the disclosures will change as a result of this disclosure initiative. Huh? So yeah, based on our assessment so far, we see or have identified limited changes to the existing disclosure. So that would be a little bit our main challenge, so so to say. Thanks, Lars. And and that leads me to the next question. That it seems like from the field field work and field tests that have been performed so far, that the the issue about uh, checklists seems to be a, a, a hot topic, so to say. So let me phrase the question this way uh, and continue to Lars also on this one: Is that do you think that the items of non-mandatory uh, non-mandatory items could become a new checklist for for the preparers? Yeah, so if if I refer back to what Catherine also said in the general introduction uh, to the session is that under the current disclosure requirements, uh, auditors and, and we ourselves as the preparers oftentimes use these disclosure requirements and the standards as some kind of checklist. In the, in the disclosure initiative uh, and under the proposed approach, we see this move away from these prescriptive disclosure requirements to the more descriptive disclosure uh, requirements, but once one moves down from these levels, from the general disclosure objectives to the quite extensive list of yeah, proposed and non-mandatory uh, items of information, one really wonders like, okay, are the auditors again going to use these 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 extensive list of, of items of information, even though they are not mandatory as explicitly mentioned, again as some kind of checklist. Uh, so it would also be good to to hear the uh, the auditor's perspective on that later on. Thanks, Lars. Uh, turning turning to Marand, um, what are your take on this? Yeah, we do we do see the risk. Yeah, that uh, these non-mandatory disclosures will become established in practice in our peers' annual reports or, or um, in other DAX companies' uh, reports. So um, and to avoid then discussion with auditors, we would then probably comply and, and then maybe have, have irrelevant disclosures then again in, in our notes. So, um, however, I think we are talking about the checklist approach. We are, we are in favor of a checklist approach, yeah, but that we, non, these man, non-mandatory disclosures we think will lead to a checklist approach at the end. Thank you very much. Turning to Martin, what are your thoughts on checklist issue yes we uh, also believe uh, that, that this uh, may be the case uh, once the uh, once auditors uh, see specific examples uh, of uh, disclosures uh, then yeah they will include them in the uh, checklist uh, but uh, currently this uh, wouldn't be uh, uh, a challenge uh, for us uh, because yes as uh, there is this uh, overlap between the existing and proposed uh, requirements uh, uh, then uh, yeah we naturally collect uh, all of uh, this information uh, and uh, yeah we have also decided uh, that uh, um, uh, such collected uh, information which is currently mandatory would uh, also uh, meet the materiality considerations uh, for the proposed uh, requirements. So, okay, we would experience some uh, challenges with this checklist approach uh, only uh, if uh, we decide uh, in future that uh, we all want to uh, leave some disclosures uh, out, but currently it wouldn't be burdensome to us. Thanks. Uh, Pierre, Pierre Henri, uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, yes, I have the, the, the same sort. And I and I would just like to add that uh, there are also in, in the exposure draft some confusing wordings that leads to consider non-mandatory items as an additional checklist. Just to take an example, uh, it's in, uh, in the proposals regarding IFRS 13, uh, fair value measurement. Uh, in, in the paragraph 103, uh, it, is, uh, it is said that an entity shall disclose information that enables users of financial, uh, financial statement to understand the amount the nature and the characteristics of each class of, uh, of uh, financial assets and liabilities measured at fair value. This is the objective. You shall disclose this type of information. Uh, 
And when you, you read the, uh, the paragraph 106, it is said that while not mandatory, a description of the nature, risk, and other characteristics of each of the classes of assets and liabilities may help, et cetera, et cetera. So it's you shall, but it's not mandatory. Uh, so it may be confusing, and uh, I understand that uh, external auditors, controllers, supervisors may uh, ask strongly to us uh, to, uh, to disclose such information. And if we do not, we'll have to strongly <laughs> justify why we do not uh, disclose them. Thank you very much, Pierre-Henri. Um, I'm turning now to Sylvie. Uh, well, there have been numerous references to the work of auditors during the first round of discussions here. So um, um, it's very interesting to hear what your thoughts are on the what could be the impact of the proposed changes on, on the audit. Um, please, Sylvie. Thanks, Klaus. Well, I have to be careful what I'm saying because I'm largely outnumbered by preparers here. But um, let me start um, with, in my mind, what I think is important is busting a myth around what a checklist is. Um, the myth is really about the word checklist. The term seems to have gotten a bit of a negative connotation, and from what I get here, it is associated with us auditors. However, I do understand that, that many preparers like using such a list as a starting point to assess which disclosures they should provide early in the process. And I also understand that some users might find it useful to um, use them when they start their um, analysis of disclosures. Therefore, I don't think that the checklist in itself in general is a negative concept. And for me, what is far more important is how that list then is used by preparers, auditors and others. And that, for me, is where materiality um, comes in. So currently assessing whether disclosures are material to the users of financial statements is um, already requiring quite a lot of judgment. And it's not always straightforward. And that comes out of the discussion that we're having today. And one of my personal concerns is that the proposed approach may introduce additional complexity and a higher burden on preparers, because under the proposals, in addition to the usual materiality judgments, preparers would now also need to decide what non-mandatory disclosures would satisfy a specific disclosure objective. And how would that impact the auditor? I think it really depends on how it all fits together. So how robust a client would be in making such a materiality assessment may have a real impact on us as auditors. Um, especially, and I think I heard that from, um, from Maren as well, in the first year of adoption, I would also expect that more effort is likely required both from preparers um, and from us. And that specifically relates to um, assessing the materiality. Therefore, if the proposals would be adopted, um, specific guidance on the application of materiality in the context of disclosures would be very, very uh, helpful. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sylvie, for your thoughts on this. Uh, now I would like to turn to Kasim. Um, Kasim, you're a user uh, of financial information and you have been involved in discussion in the user workshop and you heard the discussion today. So I'm very keen to hear what, what your reflections are uh, on, on the proposal. Great. First of all, thank you for having me here. Um, I think it's a very interesting discussion already. Um, I think I, I just want to start with a bit high level points uh, because I think this is a pilot project and it's a quite a significant shift because previously we had an equilibrium that we had a principle-based recognition measurement and then rules-based um, disclosures to, 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 and I think that was a good equilibrium. Um, I, I think with these objectives coming in, there are a few assumptions being made, and I, I think it's very important to discuss them and, and also keep them in mind, the weaknesses and the strength of it. So like the first assumption is that um, investor needs would be understood at preparer level. Um, I, I think, that might not be correct. Um, it, it has to be done at high level, but investor also is a very, very diverse group. So some investors look at through the cycle, some look at point in time cycle, then fixed income, uh, equity side, then also uh, their time horizon, how they're holding it. 
Um, so it has to be at the top level. That's correct. And I think objectives are very helpful, irrespective, because even if it's a prescriptive list, it provides a background, like why are you fulfilling that prescriptive list? Um, I think checklists, I think uh, some people have said, I, I don't know if uh, checklists really was a human being they if and went to court, uh, they would have won a big compensation for defamation. Because I think checklist has really become a taboo. Uh, I think you will need a checklist. Checklist will be there anyways, even if you have objectives, you take away an entire prescription. Uh, preparers will have to make a checklist to ensure um, that there's certain level of compliance being done of, of those objectives as well. And everyone who's checking it internally, as well as externally, auditors, regulators, they do need need a checklist. So I I, I think um, I am supportive of a minimum checklist should be there. I, I never saw an issue with it and I'm supportive of it. But I also see that um, principles base gives uh, an opportunity to come up with uh, new, better disclosures, reflecting the changes and the risk, which is positive. And going forward, I think a dynamic approach would be good to keep a minimum list for comparability, because I think uh, Catherine had this in our user uh, slide, the first point, comparability. One thing that all users will give you a consensus is they want really high level of comparability. And moving away from prescript uh, prescriptive towards objective, I cannot see how, how you can maintain that comparability, I, because I think it will be very difficult, because even though users will look at the objectives, they will still have a bias, because they will be dealing with certain investors, and what the feedback they're getting it will basically eventually impact them in interpreting those objectives. And I think it will be very difficult for auditors and regulators to enforce a consistent comparable approach. So I think those are the high level comments um, I wanted to make. Thank, thank you very much, Kasim. Uh, having heard this, uh, your concerns about comparability in, in, uh, as an outcome of this proposal, I would like to turn back to, to Sylvie as an auditor. So um, you, you heard uh, Kasim's concerns here, and does that also create concerns for you uh, from an audit perspective? And also adding to that in general, do you think that orders consider that proposals would result in information that can be audited. So because that's also a very basic point, of course. So I'm very keen to hear what you think. Thanks, Klaas. Well, I observe indeed that the proposed model has the potential to significantly well, hinder comparability given the variation in judgments that will be made by different preparers. So, and what Kasim has set out from a user perspective is very consistent with what I heard from users as part of a voluntary um, disclosure initiative that I'm involved in, where users and preparers are coming together to find some common ground on what they think is the best way of um, providing disclosures. And the disclosure proposals from users in many cases are underpinned by a wish for more comparability. But that said, I do think that um, the conceptual framework refers to comparability as a qualitative characteristic that enhances the usefulness. And IFRS also variously requires or encourages already sometimes entities to disclose information as seen through the eyes of management. For example, um, segmental disclosures and some IFRS disclosures. And by definition, therefore, they may not have the capability of being comparable. And that is something that IFRS explicitly allows. So as auditor, as auditor, when assessing disclosures, the primary focus for us is on materiality and whether the disclosed information is complete and whether it's accurate. So if information is comparable between entities or if it's comparable over time, where that is appropriate, that is, of course, preferable. However, I don't think that an auditor would... Uh, raise a disclosure difference if an entity's disclosure is not um, consistent with what peers uh, disclose. So that on the first part of your question, class, and then on the second one, I'm going to be very brief. Um, we internally had quite a few discussions, and, and most of them linked back to the materiality assessment. So at this stage, I am personally not aware of any major 
concerns around auditability of the information that would be disclosed under the proposals. And also based on what I've just heard preparers saying that um, when they had prepared their mock disclosures or did the assessment, it looks like there is a large overlap, especially for the quantitative disclosures. So on the IFRS 13 part, um, that confirms our initial views that we don't think, especially on IFRS 13, that we would have major auditability issues. Thanks. Well, that seems comforting what you're saying, that you will be able to audit uh, also in the future, this kind of disclosures. Thank you very much. Now I would like to turn to, to another topic, a uh, general topic, of course, and it's, it's the matter of balance of costs versus benefits, of course, coming out of this proposal. So I will be very keen to hear what, what the panel thinks about uh, that one. And then I would like to first give the word to Pierre Henry to hear your thoughts. Yes, thank you. Uh, as I briefly said in, uh, when answering to the first question, uh, the field test uh, did not help us to identify significant changes and improvements in the, in the notes to our final adjustments. But uh, when performing this field test, we, on the other hand, we have identified some areas where cost may uh, increase. Uh, firstly, the, since the, the exposure draft is, is proposing a new disclosures, new item of disclosures for uh, mainly IFRS 13, such as the, uh, the disclosure of alternative fair value measurement or the extension to level one and to level two of some information currently required for the only level three uh, instruments, this new information will automatically generate new costs to collect, consolidate, and provide them through the notes to financial statements. This would be uh, very mechanical. But there are also other sources of additional cost that we, we, we feel we'll have to face to uh, the increased use of judgment. It will uh, need to uh, a, a much more implication and involvement of management. And uh, in, uh, for the, for an editing, also an additional documentation of the disclosures to support how we have exercised this judgment, to support what we have disclosed, and also to justify why we have not disclosed some of the for some, some of the uh, information that are presented as why not mandatory, for instance. And uh, it will be not only a a, a one-off uh, cost for, 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 for the implementation of the, of the new approach, it will be an ongoing cost. And on top of that, we fear that audit cost may also increase just to cover the additional due diligence that auditors may have to perform regarding our own increased uh, use of judgment and uh, to check how we have answered to the, uh, uh, to the disclosure objectives. So, Additional costs, yes. Additional benefits, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, turning to Martin, uh, do you uh, have a similar view or, or do you see a slightly different balance in the cost benefit? Uh, due to the specific uh, approach uh, which we have uh, uh, taken, uh, this uh, wouldn't uh, result uh, in significant uh, uh, additional uh, costs uh, to us. Uh, uh, I believe so. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, if we, uh, this uh, was a brand new standard uh, for uh, fair value disclosures, because I have to note uh, that uh, we provided mock disclosures uh, only in this uh, area, then uh, yeah, of course uh, it would be uh, challenging uh, and. Uh, if applying uh, all the uh, judgments uh, in the appropriate uh, way, finally we could end up uh, maybe with uh, disclosures uh, which would have a little bit uh, better quality uh, to uh, what was uh, provided in our mock uh, uh, disclosures. Uh, but uh, yeah, we uh, wonder uh, whether this uh, would be worth uh, the effort uh, when um, yeah, we can base in, uh, based uh, the disclosures uh, on what uh, has worked uh, so far, uh, and uh, yeah, 
this uh, restructured uh, existing uh, disclosures still uh, uh, provide uh, appropriate uh, quality. So if we can continue uh, with uh, this approach uh, uh, based on the info information which we uh, have been uh, collecting uh, so far, we would not uh, expect uh, additional uh, costs and uh, as we could uh, hear also from Sylvie from uh, auditors uh, uh, side yeah it's uh, uh, quite probable uh, that we could continue uh, with uh, this kind uh, of uh, approach so okay. this would not result in significant additional costs okay um, maybe a slightly different view than Pierre Henri then uh, turning to Maren would be mm -hmm. interesting to hear your views Yes, I, I agree with Pierre-Henri. So in, in a brief, um, applying the new requirements to IFS 13 and 19 didn't show us any reliefs or benefits. Um, introducing the alternative fair values will increase cost because we will probably have more uh, expert opinions, which we would need to uh, have and, and require, so external export. And thirdly, applying the materiality concept um, and uh, additional disclosure requirements, applying this concept will require more time and also more, probably more cost with, uh, because the discussions with our auditors will, will be higher. So. Thanks. Um, turning to Sylvie, do you have any thoughts from an audit perspective on the, on the cost benefit side? Uh, and you can think about it all in a very broad way or, or Pure, more narrow way from an from an auditor's perspective. So, but I'm keen to hear if you have any thoughts on this. Yes, and I think what was very helpful to get the the different perspectives from Marin, Martin, and Pierre Henri, because um, we I had quite a lot of thinking and discussion about it. And I think whether there are any significant additional audit costs, that really depends on how much change um, the disclosures will bring along for a specific entity. So we will have to see, and I think that also depends a lot on where views land on, well, what actually would be needed to be disclosed, because we're going to have an interesting debate later on, as Marin already alluded to, on the alternative um, fair values, and that could that could change the dial on the cost story. Um, the other thing is the pilot currently covers existing standards, and maybe this limits disclosure change, because as we learned from Catherine when she went through her presentation, many entities take as a starting point the existing disclosures, but this story might actually be different if the proposed disclosure approach would be applied to a completely um, new accounting standard. And the other thought that I had was about the, the cost impact that may differ when we audit different types of entities, because we, we do a large spectrum. We do audits of glosses of a large group, and they have experience and knowledgeable financial reporting capability, and therefore our audit may be impacted differently compared to an entity who may not have such resources available in-house. And for that reason, even within larger group subsidiary audits may be impacted differently compared to the group audit, um, especially if a more decentralized model is applied to um, financial statement compilation. And I think um, the last point on that is that disclosures that are relevant at subsidiary, le subsidiary level may not be relevant at group level and vice versa. So leveraging efforts over disclosure audit work may not always um, may not always be possible. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and I would like to involve the audience that we have a couple of polling questions that we'd look, like to put on for, for, for the audience there to, to think about wrapping up this first session here. And the, and the first question is, of course, um, how do you think the ISB should continue with this project? And one of the specific topics that we have been dealing here with today is that um, discussing the, the uh, if the minimum disclosure requirements would be helpful. And so we also like to put that question to the audience. And with that, I also like to, to wrap up this session with a panel to, to, um, to ask them also uh, about the way forward here. Um, to, the other question is, what is the best way forward here, uh, especially focusing, focusing on, do you think that a pure objective-based approach or a combination of objectives with a prescriptive requirements or minimum uh, disclosure requirements would be the best way forward? So with that, I would like to involve all the panelists and would 
start with Lars to hear what you best, what do you think is the best way forward? Yeah, also reflecting on the discussion so far, I think that in order to uh, yeah, maintain some comparability across companies, some minimum disclosure requirements would be warranted. Huh? And, and for these minimum disclosure requirements, we could then still use some more prescriptive items of information, so to say. Well, if you then move to yeah, firm specific events or transactions, that there you would allow somewhat more yeah, de uh, yeah, descriptive disclosure requirements. That would be a little bit my view. Thanks. Uh, Maren, do you yeah. agree, agree with Lars? I do. And adding adding to what he just said, some uh, we are also in favor of the idea of a combination yeah, of a checklist. And, and the materiality approach, because from a process, not only because of comparability, which we also agree, and a certain um, level of standardization. We, we have not mentioned it here, but you see on the European um, Union level, the ESEF, yeah, where you see already uh, the tendency to standardize um, these kind of notes, disclosures, and financial information. So there are minimum requirement checklist um, we will be in, would be in favor of. And also from a process side, yeah, we have more than 700 subsidiaries that we are collecting information from, yeah, and uh, they are providing us, they are reporting on work day six. And, and we don't, if we don't have a certain standardized disclosure set, yeah, note set, um, we would not be able to compile all the information in time and also to um, then maybe discuss the materiality on group level, as Sylvie pointed out, because we need to collect the data to decide what is material or not. So, yeah, uh, final result or final assessment, we would be a combination, combination of both. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Niklas wants to, to join. Yeah, not, not not to interfere in the debate, perhaps, but, but we, we have one question from, from the audience that kind of relate to, to what is being discussed presently. And uh, the question is, if materiality judgments are key to understanding of how a company has shaped, shaped their disclosures, should then the company be required to disclose their quantitative materiality levels along with the details of the circumstances where qualitative factors have been used in determining how to meet the disclosure objectives? And in the absence of this, should then the, the auditor's quantitative uh, numbers instead be, be presented. So it's more to, to quantify the material judgments or, or not. I, I guess all in the panel would be interested in commenting on this one, perhaps. Thank you. Yes. yes. Anyone who wants to go first? Uh, Pierre-Henri, maybe? To quantify a judgment, uh... If it's a materiality one, yes, it it, it can be uh, easy. But uh, uh, if it's if it's con to quantify a, a qualitative judgment about the, the the relevance of an information to be disclosed or not, it's uh, something much more difficult. Second point: uh, disclosing some materiality um, lever, some uh, some. Uh, uh, the minimum level of uh, of an amount or maximum level of an amount uh, under which or over which we we disclose or not, uh, we we fall back in a sort of rule based approach. It is our own rules, but it's uh, when you are written these rules, uh, you shall apply them uh, every year without exercising a, a new judgment in order to uh, adjust what has been uh, still uh, provided in the, in the previous notes. So I'm not um, a little bit confused about this pro uh, this proposal. Well, while other panelists thinking about that, let me turn back to the original question. Why do you have the word Pierre Henri is thinking about if you prefer pure ob objectives uh, based approach or, or if you would prefer a combination of objectives and a minimum list approach? Pierre, Pierre Henri, if, if oh, you want. So, sorry, sorry. Can you? Okay, great. 
Oh, oh, sorry, could you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, uh, Tony, back I to did you. not hear, hear it uh, correctly. Okay. Would you prefer uh, a pure objectives based approach or an objectives based approach combined with a minimum list of disclosures? Well, I, I, I would suggest to, 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 to have this, uh, this minimum list of, uh, of required disclosures. Uh, of course, keeping the, uh, the materiality assessment as, uh, as of today. And uh, on top of that, to enhance the requirements by introducing these, uh, uh, these helpful uh, overall and specific uh, objectives. I think it is, for, for the moment, uh, a, go a good way for, for, for moving forward with this, with this project. Uh, I would also, also like to, to point uh, uh, two additional points. Uh, uh, as Marin said, uh, there is also some linkage to, to make with the, the digital reporting issues that are increasing, but also with the current and uh, oncoming development of sustainability reporting standards uh, that should be addressed as well in order to have a consistency uh, between the, how the both standards, financial one and sustainability ones, are built uh, if we want to have a good linkage linkages between uh, these two sets of information that will be provided by, uh, by companies. Thanks. Uh, turning now to Kasim, please. Yeah, I think just to reply to that question, I think on disclosures, if you observe one key element of um, gap in information gap that has been, is because of, I think, qualitative materiality. I think investors' qualitative materiality is very different to management's, uh, and I think they, sometimes that results in a lag of information coming in. Um, and I think on that point specifically, objectives could be helpful because objectives will provide a broad kind of an anchor point that gives you that, look, this is the key investor needs, that's how they look at it. So, and I think then auditors or with uh, preparers, I think it does provide that opportunity that it can be captured. And this is why, again, I think it's very important to have a minimum prescriptive list and then also an opportunity for uh, objective-based disclosure, because those specific to businesses coming from changes in cycles or certain events, external events happening, I think that can be captured um, and I think you can live with without a strict comparability, but at least like you will get that information. So, so I think it may address uh, to a certain extent the qualitative materiality information gap. Okay, okay. interesting. Uh, Martin, what is your what is your your approach? The best the best way to go forward. Yeah, based on uh, based on what I have said uh, so far, uh, this uh, may make an impression that we would be in favor uh, of uh, this uh, purely uh, principle objective uh, based uh, approach. But uh, in reality, we would uh, uh, also uh, prefer uh, to have uh, a set uh, of uh, minimum uh, uh, disclosures. Uh, uh, yeah, when uh, uh, looking uh, at the proposed requirements, uh, for example, uh, a description and uh, nature of uh, risks uh, for uh, instruments in each level of fair value hierarchy, we can't uh, imagine, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, what the quality uh, would be uh, of disclosures without uh, providing uh, this um, uh, of course, uh, the valuation uh, techniques, their descriptions and their input should also be uh, mandatory. And uh, regarding the quantitative uh, uh, disclosures, uh, then these alternative fair value measurements or doesn't matter uh, how we, uh, we call it, whether uh, just a sensitivity analysis uh, uh, in the way uh, it is labeled uh, now uh, in IFRS uh, 13, uh, this simply should be uh, provided for a level three measurements uh, because these uh, are very uh, subjective. Uh, so yeah, uh, this uh, would be the examples uh, where uh, the requirements could be made uh, uh, mandatory, and uh, this uh, would be quite uh, helpful. Thank you. And, and last but not least, Sylvie, what are your thoughts on the best way forward? 
Oh, well, I'm actually um, agreeing with um, most of what the preparers have said. I'm very much in favor of a, a mixed approach. And my arguments for it is are that I think if there would be uh, more direction, if there would be at least a minimum required list, that, um, that's that will be more efficient if there pre if there's a predetermined clear set of minimum disclosure um, requirements. And that said, I do think the whole objective around it is really helpful because that that brings in this 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 component of um, dynamism. Because if something happens that we cannot foresee now, at least we can ask to provide a disclosure when it is relevant and if that serves an, an objective. And then maybe if I may to come back quickly on that 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 question that was. Um, asked by um, a preparer. Mm -hmm. um, in the UK, we indeed have this concept of what they call a long form audit report. But I think the reason why we have it is to, to, to close that expectation gap of like, well, what does the auditor look like, look at? My only personal view is that what I personally do not like too much about it. It is very much focused on the quantitative materiality and it takes away from the qualitative aspect because I think that's also very um, very important. I'm not sure whether it would be helpful actually if all preparers would also make similar disclosures because I think for me that's something that should happen behind the scenes and what we would like to read is the actual end result, um, the financial statements. Thanks. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to, to close the first ses part of the session here and now turn from the general approach to to the, the proposals regarding uh, amending uh, IFRS 13 disclosures. Uh, so I would like to give the word back to Catherine to, to uh, explain the ISB approach uh, when you have tested this on a specific standard. Please, Catherine. Thank you very much. Uh, so we move on to IFRS 13. Um, now, the board did pick two standards that really have an, an awful lot to them. Um, so I'm not going to talk through every single aspect of the IFRS 13 proposals. Um, but what I am going to do is highlight the topics that have caused the most discussion during our field work and that I would anticipate our, our panellists touching on today. Um, so first, the biggest message that came through all of the board's user outreach on uh, uh, fair value measurement disclosures was about understanding exposure to uncertainty. And that theme of uncertainty is reflected throughout the proposed disclosure objectives. What users care about is understanding which of a company's material fair value measurements are subject to uncertainty and just how much of an effect that uncertainty might have. So the best example of that, thinking through uh, disclosures that are typically given today, is the fact that a good number of companies have a very, very large balance of level two fair value measurements. Now, some of those level two items will be close to level one, and there won't really be any uncertainty to worry users, provided they understand what those instruments are and that, that, that the measurement is, is fairly um, fairly fixed based on observable inputs, et cetera. But some of those level two measurements may be closer to level three. For example, in those situations where a company has had to apply judgment to decide that the measurement is in level three rather than in level two. Now, companies today disclose a lot of information about their level three fair value measurements. But what happens is you get circumstances where level two can be many, many, many times greater than level three. And users are left wondering, well, how much of that great big level two balance is towards the level three end and contains uncertainty? And do I need to worry about that uncertainty? So for that reason, the proposals largely avoid referring to particular levels of the fair value hierarchy. And that's not because companies are expected to disclose every last piece of information for every fair value measurement in every level of the hierarchy. Instead, it comes back to that idea of focusing the requirements on user needs and allowing companies to meet those needs in the most relevant way for their circumstances. So what the proposals are getting at is that if something is material and uncertain, users will want to know about it. So coming back to my example, for a company with a big level two balance and a chunk of that level two balance towards the level three end of things, they might need to disclose a bit more than a company for whom everything is, is more towards level one. 
Uh, now, the other topic I'm going to mention that's come up a lot throughout our field work relates to something you've already heard many of uh, our panellists mention this morning, uh, and that is the disclosure objective that relates to this idea of alternative fair value measurements. So today, for level three, companies disclose a detailed line-by-line -line sensitivity analysis, flexing individual assumptions in isolation and showing how reasonably possible changes in those assumptions could change the fair value measurement. But when you, you take that approach of thinking about the underlying user need here, that underlying need is, well, how different could this fair value measurement be? How much exposure is there? How much do I have to worry about this? And what we've heard is that there may be a simpler way of meeting that need. So, for example, looking at individuals' assumptions on their own may not reflect a realistic scenario, and therefore you can get quite complex disclosures that don't always tell users what, what that overall exposure risk is. Therefore, the disclosure objective again focuses on meeting that underlying need and gives companies a degree of freedom about how to meet it. What they are required to do is disclose information that enables a user to understand the alternative fair value measurements that could result from reasonably possible alternative inputs. Now, some kind of sensitivity could be a way to do that. And indeed, some of our fieldwork participants have concluded that for them, they would prefer to keep doing that. But equally, a straight statement of the potential range of possible fair value measurements could also meet the objectives. So unlike today, the, the proposed disclosures do not list sensitivity analysis as something that, that needs to be disclosed. Now, as I started with, this topic has probably caused more discussion than any other on IFRS 13 and has generated a huge amount of debate during the field work. Uh, so on that note, it's probably a good time to, to come back to you, Clouds, for the uh, discussion. Thanks. And, and with that, I turn in to back to Katrine to explain what the uh, FREG has experienced so far. Uh, sorry, Klaus, it's me. Um, so if Hello, we... hello Frederick. Yes, please go ahead, Frederick. So if we look on slide uh, 17, you will see just an overview of where we focused uh, a snippet of our uh, draft comment letter. So uh, the FRAC preliminary view was that sensitivity disclosures are, are more pertinent for level three than alternative fair values. We ask a question to our constituents about that. And then we have, uh, we just raised, as many people have mentioned today already, um, that uh, judgments, uh, uh, the level of judgment must not be too high that you, you run into problems around that. So what have we heard? Um, as uh, on slide 18, we discussed that in general, there were no major changes. As some of our uh, participants here today mentioned, there was some restructuring of information, et cetera. And then, yes, we did focus on alternative fair value measurements. Um, as Catherine said, some would just continue with sensitivity disclosures. Um, we did have an interesting comment, which I think even is relevant under IAS, uh, IFRS 13 today, that you could have a grossing up of exposures. So where you have, say, a net position of uh, level two assets and level two liabilities or level three uh, asset and liability, you might show a more uncertain position than is really the case. Your, your P&L would probably be flat in many cases. So, so there's a concern uh, just about the fact that we have um, split a book that's normally managed on a net basis uh, between assets and liabilities as well as between different levels. And then um, on the reduced reference to the fair value hierarchy, as Catherine uh, uh, mentioned, nobody provided alternative fair value information for level two. Um, and then there's a lot of uh, 
concern about what would that mean if we extend this information uh, requirements to level two instruments as well. So if we go to the next slide, uh, this is the feedback we had from users and auditors. So uh, we had some strong support, I would say, from sensitivity disclosures rather than alternative fair values. And then uh, there was no general support for measurement uncertainty information for, for level two in the fora that we have uh, explored this um, uh, this topic. We did have one user in our user panel that thought that this is very important information, was very surprised that this is not something that uh, management considers already on a daily basis. So so a bit of a lone voice in the desert there, but um, definitely one uh, view that we have received. And then I just wanted to show research that we've done um, a, about 18 banks, it's probably the 15 biggest banks in, in Europe, excluding the UK, so specifically the EU27, and where we added all the level one, two, and three um, assets. Uh, so you can see that if we compare the total of two trillion assets to the total of 3.7, trillion assets, there's about 55% of those in level two. However, when you do it on an individual percentage basis, like we did in the little graph on the left bottom, you will see that level one can go from zero to almost 100%. Um, the uh, level three is normally a, around less than 10%, but we do have an outlier at around 40%, and then we have everything in between. Uh, so I also just want to mention, which I think is quite important, is that level two has two types of uncertainty, and I think it is important that we consider both of those. You have these sort of level two borderline cases where maybe somebody else would have said this is level three, your entity have decided it's level two, that is fine. However, I'm not sure that the my personal view, again, this is not necessarily an FRAG view, my personal view is that level two has other uncertainties. So for example, you could have a derivative model that pops out a value and then you make an adjustment to that value for whatever reason, because of model uncertainty, because of credit risk, whatever the reason may be. So I think it is very important for us to understand what measurement uncertainty do we refer to? Because I think the borderline level two, level three instruments are far less, the Im potential impact of those are far less than say a half a basis point on the rest of level two. So we need to be clear what it is we're interested to in. Is it just the borderline uh, population? that might be manageable, or are we referring to the broader uh, measurement uncertainty? So that hopefully sets up uh, us up for an interesting debate, class. Thank you very much, Frida. Yes, indeed. Um, well, now we're turning into some more technical questions than compared to the last session, but there are some key takeaways in, in, in the proposal and, and what you experienced so far here. So the first question I would like to open with is that, uh, of course, that do you think that the alternative fair values uh, as per in the, in, in the exposure draft or a sensitivity analysis based on the inputs as per the current requirements would provide the most useful information? And also, can you also please explain whichever your approach that you prefer and why? I, I will first give the floor to Pierre Henry. Yes. Um just to, to, to provide uh, an information after what I said, uh, Katrina, uh, in my jurisdiction, uh, the proposal of the exposure draft regarding the alternative fair value measurement has been understood by stakeholders as requiring the processing of new valuation in addition to the measurements still provided in the, in the statement of financial position. And it has not been... Uh, viewed as uh, allowing the, uh, the, to, to, to maintain the only sensitivity information. Uh, if, I, if I take this, this, uh, this view uh, from our stakeholders as a, as a starting point, uh, I would say that such alternative fair value measurement are um, 
raising some issues that, that are both conceptual ones and operational ones. From a conceptual point of view, and uh, as it was uh, uh, briefly explained by, uh, by Freddy Ferreira, uh, the, 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 uh, there is a, a particular attention to be provided for uh, financial institutions that are dealing with huge amount, a huge volume of instruments, both on the asset side and in the liability side. If you are looking at a single instrument, uh, for which you, you you have used a judgment and some uh, unobservable inputs. You can say uh, you have a, you have a fair value of 100. It could be 90. It could be 105. Fine. You have the range of alternative fair value measurement, and you you can ex, uh, assess the the potential impact of uh, of these uh, alternative views uh, on uh, on your on your PNL on your financial situation. But when you when you have both asset and liability uh, instruments. Uh, valued using the same unobservable input, uh, there will be a symmetrical position, a symmet and you cannot assess the, these alternative views taking only the worst case scenario in, in the asset side and the worst case scenario in the liability side. There will be automatically a compensation and, and offsetting. And how to deal with such situation when providing an, a relevant disclosure, that's a real question. Second issue, the operational, the operational one. Today, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the fair value measurement of level three instruments, which are complex instruments, is something quite complex and time consuming. If you had uh, to this uh, valuation in the balance sheet additional valuation, make, it will add additional, it will add a, a new tasks to be performed, so it will need additional time during a very tight schedule for issuing the financial statements. So there will be some also some operational issues in order to respect the time schedule of the preparation of the financial statements. It will, of course, have had an additional cost for both processing the valuation and both auditing this new calculation. So. At the end of the day, when we when we are talking with our uh, internal uh, valuation experts and risk management experts, uh, this, according to them, sensitivity information remains a more con a more consistent and closer to their risk management practice, and according to them, it, it provides a, a more uh, useful information to uh, to users and also to supervisors. Maybe instead of replacing the information of alternative fair value measurement. It could be suggested also to to improve the uh, the current requirements uh, around sensitivity, maybe in order to to have to, uh, to have a better comparability between uh, between issuers. It may be a, a way. Thanks, Pierre and Lee. Uh, turning to Martin, um, interesting to hear your views. Yeah, well, we have uh, fulfilled uh, this uh, proposed uh, requirements uh, based on uh, existing uh, sensitivity uh, analysis disclosures because we believe that uh, they fit uh, this uh, uh, purpose uh, the way we uh, prepare them so they uh, are the suitable also for this uh, alternative uh, fair values. Uh, as I have uh, mentioned, uh, yeah, there was a challenge when uh, preparing uh, these disclosures uh, uh, to uh, decide uh, whether they would be applicable uh, also uh, to level two. Uh, yeah, based on the requirements, uh, they are not specific uh, only for uh, level three. And uh, then, uh, we had to perform some uh, judgments uh, uh, whether uh, for uh, level uh, two uh, shifting uh, unobservable inputs uh, for this kind of measurement within some uh, reasonable uh, ranges would uh, lead to significantly uh, different uh, fair values. And uh, our conclusion uh, was uh, that uh, this uh, would not uh, shift uh, fair values significantly. So we did not uh, decide to provide uh, this but uh, in future, uh, if uh, these requirements uh, 
uh, still uh, hold uh, as they are uh, uh, drafted. We, yes, we will have to uh, perform a more uh, detailed uh, analysis uh, uh, to uh, uh, defend uh, potential non-disclosures of uh, uh, level two measurement uh, uh, sensitivities or uh, alternative uh, fair value uh, measurements. Yeah. So here. Uh, some work will have to be uh, done, but we are ready for it. But uh, yeah, this uh, would result in a, a additional uh, effort uh, and uh, costs. Uh, when uh, talking about this, uh, I would uh, like uh, to uh, stress that uh, in our uh, view, this uh, sensitivity uh, analysis or fair value measurements uh, uh, should uh, really focus uh, only on uh, unobservable uh, inputs. Uh, because the uh, fair value is uh, fair value definition is uh, a uh, is strictly market based and for example in this alternative fair value measurements uh, we should not uh, include uh, how the fair value uh, measurements would uh, look uh, like if we shift uh, uh, interest uh, yield uh, curves uh, which uh, have uh, underlying uh, active market uh, behind uh, them uh, yeah of course uh, Banks are very much exposed uh, also to uh, market uh, risks. Uh, I have mentioned the example of interest rate risk, uh, um, but uh, yeah, here uh, this is uh, IFRS 7 standard, which uh, provides the analysis how much we are exposed to such kind of risk. So uh, alternative fair value measurements or sensitivity analysis, whatever the users would like uh, better. Um, they should uh, really focus on unobservable inputs and potentially uh, the, also level two uh, measurements uh, uh, should be uh, in question in this uh, regard. Thank you very much, Martin. Turning to, to Marion, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, maybe before I answer the question, some uh, uh, general remark. Yeah, as I'm here as a representative from a non-financial institution. Um, so. Uh, we need to apply the requirements in IFRS 13 and, and 9 and 7, as just mentioned, um, li like the financial institutions. However, we were always in favor to have separate uh, standards for financial institutions, but the ISB uh, did not uh, or decided differently. Um, so we are not that much concerned. However, as I said, the requirements are the same. So uh, when we would need to provide alternative value, as I said before, that will be additional cost because we would need more external opinions on that. We would also have more dis discussions with our auditors. And we, we think it's not useful because there's, again, judgment. Yeah, it's judgment in, in each fair value and having an alternative one um, adds judgment from our point of view. So we do not uh, support this proposal. We are very well in favor of the sensi uh, sensitivity analysis as it is today. So we would prefer to keep it because we think this is useful information and, and gives the users the, the necessary information on fair values. Thank you very much. Um, turning to Sylvie, from an auditor perspective, would you prefer the current standard or, or the proposed amendments? Thanks, Klaas. Um, well, my personal preference definitely goes out to sensitivity analysis, and I think it's it's very aligned with the, the point that Martin made, that I think this provides a lot more focus on the un unobservable variable, variables, because that is where the uncertainty or the estimation uncertainty resides. So I am not convinced that providing alternative fair values, taking in, into account also the observable inputs, results in more relevant information. So I'm a bit skeptical and not sure, therefore, whether the cost of such a change would be justified um, because I'm not convinced about the benefits. However, if, if the question would have been asked to me differently, would I preclude entities to use alternative fair values instead of a sensitivity analysis to provide insights in estimation uncertainty? Then probably my answer would be no, I would not preclude preclude that as long as it's very clear the, um, which unobservable inputs uh, have been flexed in, in which ways. Thank you. Thanks very much. And, and then that naturally leads to the, the question to, to Kasim, what you as a user would prefer? Um, I think um, 
I I had an example um, where it was a non-banking financial institution, and uh, they had a very exotic uh, instrument, a very heavy level three book. And I think the problem I was having was that they didn't disclose how they were measuring those uh, methodology. Um, and the other issue that was happening was there was a lot of reclassifications happening between level two and level three. And I think it was done deliberately because as they moved to level two, they weren't required to disclose a lot of information. Um, so they were using that arbitrage. Um, and I think it, it does some do um, use that loophole um, to, to hide information or to obscure information. And I think ideally, I, I do favor alternative. I think if you are in level three, a range, because remember the range could be low in benign or stable economic situations, but when they are stressful, the range could be uh, much broader. And I think if the range is much broader, then I think the second layer comes in is the unobservable sensitivity or which one is the input that is having the major impact. So you don't have to disclose it all the time, but I, I do think that that is very helpful. Um, the other thing I, I would also suggest, I know that it from cost perspective, it's, it's, it's horrendous, but ideally level three reconciliation should also be extended to level two, or if, if for cost reasons that is not possible, then really you need to have a very tight uh, dividing line that uh, items which are in level two, which are very close to level three, you really push them in level three and those which are clean should stay there. Thanks, Kasim. Yeah, but that's an interesting point, of course, that could also lead to further debate. So, But I would like to, to jump to another question here. As uh, Frederic showed in, in showing uh, slide number 20 um, about the distribution of fair values uh, within uh, 18 major European banks, that was interesting. And uh, a follow-up question on that is that if you read the proposed paragraphs 111 and 112 on alternative fair values, they do not specify that these are intended only for level three instruments. Um, so an interesting question is, of course, what are your thoughts on the ISB implicitly including level two in, in the requirement for alternative fair values? And I would start uh, here to, to uh, hear what Sigmi thinks about that. Thank you. So if we were living in an ideal world, my answer would be as follows, because if instruments are accurately classified between level two and level three, then I would say, despite the fact that the amount that we have shown, that we have seen in the graphs that Frederick showed us, despite the fact that they are quantitatively material, I would then say, based on the proposals, I don't think there's a need to insist on disclosures of alternative fair values, because in such a case, the unobservable inputs would not give rise to significant estimation uncertainty. And therefore, on a qualitative basis, I would then say, like, such information is therefore not required to be disclosed because it's not material. That said, when we were discussing this point um, previously and even as recent as yesterday, um, we continue to have this discussion about borderline um, instruments. And I think Kazi made a point like, well, if they are really borderline, you still have this question, should they be pushed from level two to level three? And I'm as a skeptical auditor, if I see a lot of instruments where people argue they think this disclosure would be required, my first um, instinctive reaction would be, why are they in level two? Should you not push them to level three? But um, two further thoughts after having reflected on the discussions um, that we had. Potentially, if the agreement would be really, oh, there are indeed some borderline level two instruments, possibly based on IS1, it would be worth then pushing or making disclosures on like the judgment that has been made. Because if that's really a significant judgment, we have a requirement in IS1 to um, provide disclosure on it. So that might be where we can find potentially some middle ground. But I personally, I would not insist on having it um, for level two instruments. Um, so hopefully um, that gives some insight on how I look at it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sylvie. Uh, well, turning back to Kazim then, uh, what do you thought? Do you want to have these kind of disclosures also for level two instruments? 
Um, I, I think um, also speaking yesterday, I think uh, mm -hmm. my and Sylvia comments, I think quite aligned because I do think either, the, the, at least there should be a very clear management disclosure, like how management differentiate between level two and level three, because I, I'm not convinced that it's done consistently across the board. Um, and maybe on bank side, it might be because it's heavily regulated, but especially on the non-banking side, it's it, banking financial institution, this is not the case. Um, so I, I and, and I think it's, it's really a question back to the standard setter, like should there be a much more tough, tougher borderline, like if there are more um, indicators that show that it is actually, uh, like you, you use a strict criteria that you push more items towards level three, and then relax level two requirements, so you don't apply them on level two, um, or you apply consistently on both level two and level three if that distinction is, is not possible. So I think it's probably a standard setter question, but I, I think I, I agree with what Sylvia just said. Interesting. And, and then turning, of course, to to, uh, to the preparers then, and, and starting out with the financial institutions. So what are your thoughts, Martin, uh, this? Yeah, well, for the purpose of uh, mock uh, uh, disclosures, uh, uh, we were also uh, dealing with uh, uh, potential fair value measurements uh, for uh, uh, with potential alternative fair value measurements uh, also for uh, level two, but we came to a conclusion uh, that uh, there, uh, the impact uh, on alternative fair values uh, when uh, shifting uh, those uh, unobservable inputs uh, used uh, for them should not uh, be uh, uh, material. Um, this uh, results uh, uh, from uh, the definition of, of uh, level two instrument uh, itself uh, when uh, looking uh, at a uh, single uh, instrument uh, that uh, there uh, the unobservable inputs uh, must uh, have insignificant uh, effect to qualify for uh, a level two uh, and uh, this should be true even if we uh, shift uh, uh, the an observable input within some uh, uh, reasonable uh, range, uh, but then we approached it uh, also uh, from uh, more uh, a portfolio perspective, uh, uh, where uh, such valuation adjustment could be more significant at uh, the portfolio level. Based on qualitative assessment, we also came to a conclusion that this should not have a significant effect, but uh, this is a uh, very uh, a gray uh, area. And uh, as I have uh, said, that uh, yeah, the ISB should indicate uh, that uh, entities uh, should also uh, with uh, uh, this uh, uh, and uh, ensure that uh, users uh, have uh, the, the appropriate uh, information about uh, potential uh, sensitivities uh, of such uh, uh, measurement. But uh, for example, uh, even here, the, uh, there is uh, one uh, unobservable uh, input uh, uh, which uh, we use, uh, and uh, there even internally we perform uh, such a sensitivity uh, analysis. If we shift it, uh, uh, then uh, okay, does it have uh, some uh, significant impact? And if we come to the conclusion, then uh, the entire uh, fair value uh, measurement uh, goes to, to uh, level uh, three due to uh, such uh, internal sensitivity uh, analysis. Uh, so due to this, uh, yeah, we came to a conclusion that we should not uh, uh, provide uh, any uh, data for uh, level two uh, disclosures uh, uh, for level two uh, measurements, uh, uh, but yeah, this is uh, uh, the area uh, which is open for uh, further specification uh, by the ISB, and uh, I believe uh, that uh, the ISB uh, should be more specific uh, what they mean in this area because uh, here. here really here for this uh, level two gray measurements, uh, some important information may be hidden uh, towards uh, users. M many thanks, Martin. Uh, and, and then I would like to turn to Pierre-Henri to hear uh, your thoughts. Hi, uh, yes. Should requirements uh, on this topic be extended to level two instruments? Uh, 
Uh, I think the operational burden I mentioned when I, when I answered the previous question, uh, this operational burden will, would be hugely increased given the, the, the volume of instruments and the granularity of, these, of the instruments classified in the level two category. At least uh, such requirements uh, should be limited to the only ones that are uh, valued using some unobservable inputs. But as it was previously said by, by, by other uh, speakers, normally in level two, unobservable input have, should have only limited impact on the valuation. So what would be the relevance of the information? If, maybe uh, another, another, uh, another way maybe to address the issue of the gray areas mentioned in the exporter draft is maybe to, in, to enhance, to improve the, uh, the boundary between level two and level three, maybe to keep the light gray in the level two and the dark gray uh, moving to the level three. <laughs> I don't know how many shades there are, and to limit specific disclosure to this only scope of level three uh, instruments. That's a proposal. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that constructive proposal. Turning to uh, a non-financial company, Amaran, what are your mm -hmm. thoughts? I, I think I know what your thoughts are, but <laughs> uh, keen to hear them out. Yeah, I mean, I'm obviously not the only one reading the comments. Um, uh, yeah, we don't agree with these proposals, and uh, we see, as I said before, additional costs. Yeah, um, and um, without any additional um, benefits for users. Okay. Short and clear. Um, I have one final question before we go to the, the, we have a couple of polling questions also for the audience, but one final question uh, on, on a detail here, and that is addressed to Pierre Henri. Um, in um, in uh, paragraph 117a of the proposal, it's proposed that uh, should, there could be non-mandatory disclosures about reasons for changes in level one and level two. So I'm keen to hear your thoughts, Pierre, on, the, on uh, if you think that is a good proposal or not. Yes, uh, when paragraph 117, mentions a reference to the previous paragraph, 116. It's not very clear whether um, the information proposed as to be non-mandatory for level one and level two could be provided with a lower granularity of the different changes that uh, are expected to be uh, disclosed. Is it a lower granularity or the same as the one that is, exp that is required for uh, level three instruments in uh, the paragraph 116? There's the question here. But uh, on an operational point of view, uh, if you want to have uh, on a constituted basis all the, all the available information in order to, to decide which information to, to provide in the notes, you will have unavoidably to uh, collect all of these different changes from all your reporting entities in the group, your, all your subsidiaries, and with a uh, granularity which uh, will allow you to, to, um, to control that all the figures are correct. So the operational burden will still be there. And uh, given the, uh, as I said previously, given the, the high uh, volume of instruments in level one and level two uh, categories, it will be a huge, uh, a huge issues to the, for the for the implementation of these new requirements. And uh, from a, a conceptual point of view, I do not really see uh, the, uh, the the benefits to provide such information, at least even for level one instruments because of the, uh, how it helps to um, users to understand the uncertainties of fair value measurements in the financial statements. Level one are not uncertain. What is uncertain is the market, but that's another, uh, another issue. But the, the, the fair value as it is uh, mentioned for level one instruments in the, in the financial statements are not uncertain. So why heading such information about these changes? It's more a question of management report, what was the activity, but not a question of financial statements for this category. 
Thank you very much. That was a clear, clear position, Pierre Henri. Uh, before moving on to the polling questions, I would like to give the, the, the word to Catherine because I think Catherine has a comment on, on a comment that Kasim made made earlier. Please, Catherine. Thank you. Yeah. So, so just to, to come to this point about the, the borderline between uh, level two and three, I think Kazim uh, made some very valid comments about perhaps other things the board could, could consider in terms of defining that line or requiring companies to explain how they have made judgments about, about which side something falls on. Um, the, the, the first thing I would say that is actually to uh, reiterate Pierre Henri's point about shades of grey, which I think is, 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 is a good way of looking at it, because something that came through very clearly from all of our outreach was that the um the, the level of, of subjectivity, if you like, in fair value measurements is not three distinct buckets. It's a complete sliding scale. So the two categories at the end of that scale, one and three, pretty clear, but level two, however you define the edges, is always going to have a range of, of instruments within there. And you, you kind of have to draw the line somewhere. And every company has, has a different um, set of, of items within that range. So there's no sort of perfect bright line that, that, that that's going to, to magically make things simple because it is this continuum almost does exist. So one thing that the board did consider when we were developing the proposals was precisely what you mentioned, Kazim, should we require companies to explain how they have made judgments around the level two, three borderline. And the reason that the board did not um, go down that route was because um, our research suggested that that requirement would, in practical terms, lead companies to largely repeat the requirements of the standard. Level two is this, level three is this, and that that would not be be genuinely useful information for users. It would be a bit boilerplate. So the board did conclude that it would be better to essentially ask companies to, to explain what's in their level two portfolio and to the extent that there is this uncertainty to then go, you know, apply the subsequent disclosure objectives to, to, to the items in question. Um, so in short, I, I think that, you know, the comments we've received from you guys and, and the, the outreach and field work we've done more generally really do demonstrate that I think Think in terms of getting across the intention here that there are things that, that could be done better. And indeed, we've had many suggestions um, about ways to move forward that, that might be improvements on what's in the ED. But I just wanted to share that background because I think it's relevant to, to some of the suggestions that have been made today. But but thank you for the, for the very useful feedback. Many thanks, Catherine. And with that, I, I think we're going to wrap up this session now by launching the two polling questions that we have. We have a uh, Connecting to what we have discussed here, the first question is to the audience, do you think that providing alternative fair values is too burdensome for preparers when compared to sensitivity information currently required for level three instruments? And the other question is, do you consider that information about reasons for some changes in level one and two, uh, apart from reclass reclassification between levels are useful to users? So uh, please can we launch those questions and them on for a couple of minutes in order to may, uh, enable the participants to answer. And if if I may ask Niklas then to, if you could make some comments then when we are receiving the results, I would be very happy. Okay, I will do that. Thanks.
So I think the responses will come soon. So we wait for the responses and uh, I think in, in some seconds we have them. So it may be interesting to see. Uh, there might be. There we have the first preview. Uh, the first question then, do you think that providing alternative fair values is too burdensome for some? And we see that 58, or almost 59% consider it to be too burdensome. Um, uh, and we have almost 18% that says no. Uh, I think it would be interesting to, to have that afterwards divided into financial institutions contra others <laughs> as well. Uh, because I, I assume those that have a very few fair values could do it, even though they may need consultants, while uh, as the banking representatives here have described it, it might not be that relevant always for, for banks as well. See the next one. Do you consider that information about the reasons for some changes, level one and two items apart from reclassifications between levels are useful? And there we have a more dividing views. Yes, 40%. And uh, if material fair value measurements that can be used users justify the likely cost. Yes, the information is useful, but the cost for preparers exceeds any benefits. So it's a lot of yes and very few no's there. Yeah, I don't know if it's any remarks from, from, from the panel or, or yeah. others on this. And the, and the reflections it seems to be a con conflicting interest between useful information and, and uh, costs for preparers here, which is not unusual. And, and I can also add for what Niklas said that I think it's important here to remember that uh, there are banks and, and there are also non-financial institutions. So it's important. And anyone on the panel that want to come with a final comment before we close the session? If not, then fine. Then I think we need to move to the last part uh, to keep up speed of this webinar. And now we move into IS-19 employee benefits. That we are, most of us are very interested in, uh, not only for accounting reasons, but also for other reasons. Uh, and with that, I would like to give the word back to, to Catherine to, to introduce the, uh, the proposals uh, that you have made in the exposure draft. Thank you very much again. Uh, so yes, on to our other test case, which is employee benefit disclosures. Uh, now, once again, uh, I'm going to resist talking through every aspect of the proposals and instead focus on those areas that have given rise to the most debate and discussion amongst our fieldwork participants. Uh, so, so the overriding message we received when we did our outreach on employee benefits was that for users, they see defined benefit plans as where the risk is and therefore what they are most interested in. So the proposals are most detailed in the area of defined benefit plans. And in fact, we have six specific disclosure objectives there. And this is also what a great majority of the field work uh, discussions have been about. So I'd say the big message coming through for defined benefit schemes is about the potential for improved relevance and effective communication. Um, so, so one example of that and a very prevalent theme that came through was the importance of information about how a material defined benefit plan is expected to affect a company's cash flows. That is the cash flows that the company will need to, to put into the scheme to, to ultimately meet its obligations. Now, investors say they don't get enough information on this today, and it is an area where they feel the relevance of information re really could be improved. 
In fact, users have told us that cash flow information is the most useful thing they could get about a defined benefit scheme. Indeed, many of them have said it would be more useful than, than some of what they get today. And at the same time, companies have told us they understand why users would want this information. And in fact, often it's something they're monitoring anyway, because it is really important. So there's potential opportunity for, for real improvement with this aspect of the proposals. And the best example on the cash flow topic is that when a user sees a material defined benefit obligation, they want to know, OK, how is company management thinking about this? How do they ultimately expect to see it off? To the extent that scheme assets don't fund liabilities, how is the company ultimately thinking it will address the resulting deficit? And this is another area where the objectives-based approach gives companies a degree of freedom about exactly how they provide information that would enable that user need to be met. And the fieldwork has demonstrated why that's important. We've heard from companies who have a clear idea of how deficits will be addressed and the effect that that might have on cash flows. For example, they might have agreed deficit payments with scheme trustees. And in those cases, users want to know what those companies' expectations are, what agreements are in place. We've spoken to other companies who don't have those kinds of plans in place just now. For example, cash might currently be directed elsewhere and there's a reliance on scheme assets, at least for the foreseeable future. And in those cases, users don't generally want companies to, to make up information just for the sake of disclosure, but they do want to know how management is thinking about this. The fact that no ex effects on current cash flows is expected at the moment and, and why the company is, is okay with that. So there's just a couple of examples. I could give many, many more, but really it's about honing in on the user need described in the objective and providing the information that would best meet that need in each case. Now, the other topic that has uh, generated the most discussion uh, is, again, on sensitivity analysis on key assumptions to do with the defined benefit scheme. Now, the, the discussions we've had in this area are actually very similar to, to what we've talked about on IFRS 13. Um, in short, the board learned there may be a simpler way to address the underlying user information need and has focused the disclosure objective accordingly asking a company to provide the information that enables a user to understand the assumptions used, assess the level of measurement uncertainty, but ultimately allowing a degree of freedom in exactly how that's done. As I said, that, that whole um, idea is very, very similar to what we've touched on on IFRS 13, so I won't go into further detail there, um, but we'll, we'll hand over for, for the discussion. Many thanks. And turning to Fred Ray, what have you, what have EFRAG experienced so far in, in your outreach work and field tests? So if I go directly to slide 24, uh, where we talk about our, um, the feedback and here we focused, I'm sort of summarizing on four themes, the measurement uncertainties related to the defined benefit obligation, the expected future cash flows, as well as the nature of benefits and risks of the uh, defined benefit uh, defined benefits plans and other employee benefits. So, so here uh, we haven't had uh, significant changes to the information provided. Most of the most or all of the preparers actually preferred sensitivity analysis. Um, we had some um, concerns or, or questions about the usefulness about the future payments to the defined benefit plans that are close to new members. And I also think we had a very interesting query on the usefulness of expected return on assets. Um, I was actually quite surprised that this is not required by IS-19. But that might be because I think that has quite a significant impact on on the uh, the liability record. But uh, it seems like some people have different views on that. If we go to the next slide, we see what uh, the auditors and users thought. So both of them were very supportive of our sensitivity analysis rather than than anything else. Uh, there was also mixed support from users about alternative actual. Uh, Sorry, that must be actuarial assumptions, uh, because there was a concern that this would be amount to second guessing of assumptions. Now, I think that you also have many actuaries who review these disclosures and who would maybe want to know um, 
uh, they might have their own opinion about these assumptions. So uh, that to me was just quite an interesting one. The cash flow information was considered to be useful as well as the expected run, re, rate of return and then a comparison to, to what was actually achieved. Um, and uh, so those are some of the highlights of what we've heard during the uh, outreach, sorry, of the field test and the related outreach. So I hope that can be a good introduction to hear from the horse's mouths, as it were, um, what the thoughts are on the field test. Bennett, thanks, Fredre. For, for this session, I would like now to, to launch two polling questions before we get into the panel discussions. And the first question is about if you think that uh, sensitivity analysis would outweigh the costs of, of providing the information. And the second one is uh, uh, to, that if you consider that the information about future cash flows of defined benefit obligations to be uh, significantly important. So can we please... Uh, Launch the polling questions. And as, as for the, the the last session, I would also ask Niklas then to pick up on the results, and then we can, after we have gone through the results, move to the panel discussion. Thanks. Yeah, just to make sure for, for the participants in the webinar that we do not have a broadcasting problem. So I just keep on, have a little chit chat while, while you are thinking about the questions and answering them. So please remain comfortable that we have not had any hiccups. We can now see that our answers are coming in. Just to repeat the questions again, the first question is if you agree with the proposal that sensitivity analysis would outweigh the costs. And the second question is about um, the um, importance of, of information about future cash flows. can also re remind the audience that you can also uh, ask questions in the comment box that we can pick up in the end of the session. So. And perhaps comment on the answer as well, because I think the answer on some of these questions are dependent on the, the, your own experience and your own situation, I think. Exactly. Now we, now can we see have the, some, yeah, some result. first results here on the first question. We have uh, around 40% that believe that the, the disclosure objective will provide users with a reasonable idea of the range of possible values for the defined benefit obligation. Uh, and we have around 18% that consider that sensitive information currently provides insufficient information to the users. And we have 24% almost that say that you know, the range of possible values for the defined benefit obligations is not the information that users require to understand the impact of future changes in the discount rates. 
the, the, the things I have heard, if I start comment a little mm, bit, yes. is that, that, that the, 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 the sensitivity with regards to the discount rate is the main sensitivity that, that are continued to be requested by, by the other ones, that they are not really current values, they are more long term in that respect. So, so it's, uh, it's, it's a different nature of them. If you look at question eight, then we have 35% uh, saying, yes, this forms the basis of the calculation and therefore this is important information and allows analysts to do their own sensitivity analysis as preferred. And we had 24% say no, sensitivity information is more important to users. And we have 41 saying that the timing of cash outflows and sensitivity information are both equally important and should be provided. And hey, I think also that it's really dependent on the kind of pension system you have and what kind of obligation there are to provide more cash into the pension system or not. And that's it's dependent on the laws in different countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Niklas. Um, so turning now to the panel, so do, I would like to kick off the first question of, of course, of what are your thoughts around the requirements for, for cash flows of defined benefit obligations? So maybe I would like to turn to Lars first to say what, what your thoughts are. Thanks, Klaas. Yeah, of, of course. So in, in responding to this question, I think that it's first of all important to indeed emphasize as well that the majority of our pension plans at this very moment are uh, defined contribution plans. And also based on a recent conversation with investor relations, we generally receive yeah, limited requests for additional information on the defined benefit uh, plans uh, as such. If I then look uh, at the disclosures with respect to the defined benefit plans that we already provide, and indeed we start off with a, a summary of the general characteristics of these uh, of these plans. No, first of all, and if I look at the contrib uh, contributions, so the cash flows uh, with respect to the defined uh, benefit obligations, we limit our disclosure to one year ahead. No? So if looking indeed at the, at the proposals, then I think that this is indeed one area of improvement that we identified for additional disclosures. No? So uh, in order uh, by by yeah, providing additional information on, on the future cash flows, on the future contributions, uh, we could provide uh, the users with more useful information on how we are reducing the deficit over time. So yes, I do believe that uh, that indeed these future cash flows um, yeah, could provide additional uh, useful information to our users. Many thanks, Lars. Uh, turning to Marin, would you concur with Lars's views on this point? Yeah, I agree. Um, and maybe one just one additional thought. So uh, yes, we think it's it's a useful um, information for users. Yeah, and it's not, and it's easy to to provide it regarding the defined benefit uh, plans because we have this already as basis for the actuarial reports. However, I think it needs to go along with further explanations and additional information because it only covers the obligation side. Yeah, so we have uh, uh, plan assets and um, so financed out, so to speak, our obligations, and they would the cash flows or cash inflows would, of course, then not be uh, considered. So that would need to be explained, of course, that we are only looking at the obligation side. Yeah. Uh, thanks. And, and turning to the same question to Pierre Henry, uh, what are your thoughts on? on I have, I, actually, I, uh, I have not significant uh, thing to add. I share, I fully share the, what was uh, said by uh, by my two colleagues. Uh, ju ju just remarks. Uh, I've noted in, uh, that in the exposure draft there are uh, the, for for information related to the to the future cash flows and the and the timing of this cash flow. The, the, there is a, a new requirements for distinction between. Uh, defined benefit plans that are closed and the other that are not closed. Uh, when we discuss this, uh, this issue with uh, our uh, internal uh, human resources and financial specialists and, uh, which are dealing with these, uh, with these plans, they do not uh, clearly understand the, the, uh, the reason why uh, of such a distinction. And, uh, 
we find more useful and information about how the risks generated by such plants are managed, are hedged, and, uh, and how the, the, the entity will, will, behave, will be able to, to cover its future commitments. Thanks, Pierre-Henri. And, and of course, then it's interesting to hear from, from a user, from Kasim, what, what do you think uh, about um, information about future cash flows? Um, I think future cash flow is the most important aspect, like even if you're looking at the sensitivity analysis um, or all the other key variables like weighted average life, and I think even if you have how, how much um, active members you have, how much uh, uh, members are already in retirement, I think those all are taken into consideration to understand what is the impact, what is the deficit that you're running, uh, how long is going to take to fill that uh, gap, and how will you fill that gap? Will that you will because if you are running a big funding gap, effectively you're saying that I will use that to fund my own operations, and from the return I will make, I will uh, basically uh, then use that to uh, uh, pay in the in the future. Um, so I think all those aspects are very critical, and I think all the disclosures that are made currently basically, I think, uh, points towards um, some kind of an understanding of, of uh, cash flow. And many thanks, Kasim. Um, I know I would like to, to turn to, to Gert as an actuary to, to hear what, what are your views as an actuary on, on the cash flow requirements? You're on mute, uh, Gert. Sorry. Okay. No problem. Okay. Now, we can, now we can hear you. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Because I think I fully agree. I mean, uh, the cash flow requirements, but it's not a new thing. I mean, I mean, as Lars mentioned, typically companies already today give an indication of the contribution for the following year. In many cases, I think it's more difficult uh, to give longer term projections. If information is available about deficit reduction contributions, of course, it makes sense to give it. But in a lot of countries, I think that will be difficult because it's heavily related to the to the evolution of the plan assets, which is more unpredictable. Uh, I think for the uh, for the funded plans as well, it might be difficult to give also a lot of information on uh, cash flow impacts about contrib future contributions because it's quite complex. I mean, minimum funding requirements they vary so much from one country to another, uh, that you could basically write a book about the whole regulatory environment, and that cannot be the purpose. Okay? But a simple thing, in my view, that may be an improvement, if, if, if companies would give a simple breakdown of the key metrics between funded and unfunded plans, and by the main countries, because typically a lot of companies just have a few large important plans in a limited number of countries. And then sophisticated users, they probably are familiar with the regulatory uh, environment for, for, key, for, let's say, key pension countries. So you don't need to repeat that general information in the, in the disclosures. And it may give you a clear view on where do you have unfunded plans, in which countries, what is the amount of underfunding, what is the duration, so uh, that's something that I believe uh, could be a, a pragmatic solution to and reach the same objective. As to the, the, uh, the thing about the closed pension plans, there I'm a little bit, uh, I don't know, I'm not so convinced as well about the added value of giving information about the period uh, over which payments still have to be made. Uh, especially if those closed plans are funded. Uh, and I also think often, I mean, a closed pension plan, it may be replaced by a similar plan, uh, providing similar benefits or equivalent benefits. So what's the added value of, of giving information on cash flows for a closed plan? Well, well, similar payments may continue under the successor plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think uh, Kasim wants to make a comment on what Gert just said. So please go ahead, Kasim. Um, I, I think I agree with uh, Gert. Like, I, I don't think 
companies themselves can provide a lot of information because it is long term. But I think what it's mainly actually analyst job to to understand what are the other factors and make their own judgment and, and analysis. But I think what we need is is the data points, consistent data points that we can compare and contrast. But I, I do like to come back on the closed pension plans because I, I did see certain issuers, they had closed pension plans. Um, they were underfunded. Um, their assets were in a very defensive portfolio. The return is like mainly in in fixed income, so you know that their return systematically is is lower than the yield they're using to discount their liabilities, and and I think that's why I've been asking uh, regulators and standard setters that expected rate of return should be disclosed, especially at this point in time where your asset prices are really high, and most of the funds I think they will be getting into more maturity phase. Um, so there should be a sensitivity analysis for those issuers which which have very underfunded, very defensive portfolio, uh, because I, th I think they should use that expected yield to discount the liability and provide a sensitivity or what is the exact gap. The other also aspect I think issue we have noted is that a lot of times actuarial funding gaps have been agreed, but they are not disclosed uh, by issuers. I think that is also a missing information link. Thanks. Um, reflecting on the fact that we have now brought up the, the topic about uh, clo uh, closed plans, I would like to give a brief word to, to Catherine to explain how the ISP has thought about this. Uh, sure, thank you. So, so there is the, the the one objective in the proposal that is very specific to closed plans. Um, so, given the questions come up, just to explain that the, the reason in there really is that once a plan is closed to new members, um, there is a, a much more um, clear position about how long a user will have to continue worrying about that plan. I, how long is that company going to need to continue to be thinking about and making sure that the, the obligations relating to that plan can be met? Whereas for a plan that continues to, to receive new members, there's almost no, no answer to that question. So the reason that closed plan plans come up specifically in the requirements is that given there are, there are now a lot of closed plans, there is some specific information about those plans that, that would be useful, that is perhaps less useful for an open and plan because it's not as, as straightforward an answer because it's a moving target. So just to, to provide a bit of a bit of flavour on that one. Many, many thanks, Catherine, for explaining that. Uh, I would like to turn to, to 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 another topic now, and that is back to the sensitivity analysis. And and first, addressing the question to Marin, uh, can you p provide your thoughts about the sensitive that sensitive and uh, sensitivity analysis requirements will not longer be mandatory? Yeah, as I said before, regarding sensitivity analysis uh, in, in IFRS 13, um, we think it's a very useful information. And we think it's um, also for, for preparers, but also for um, users. So we would actually prefer to keep it. Clear, clear and straight answer. Uh, Lars, would you concur with that? Uh, definitely, class. Uh, so I uh, fully concur with uh, Marin there. And uh, that was also reflected already in the summary overview as presented by uh, Friedria bef before that the sensitivity analysis is still the preferred approach, uh, I would say. If I look at the disclosure objectives uh, uh, and, and, the, and the disclosure initiative with respect to these yeah, uh, um, uh, pension plans, then there sh should sh still be some disclosure on the measurement uncertainty with respect to these defined benefit uh, obligations. And one of the alternatives would again be like these uh, alternative actuarial assumptions. Now, if I look now at the, the process, uh, how we set up, uh, and, uh, how the process is actually designed, uh, we get the input from an external actuary. They are already challenged by local actuaries. Yeah. And then we get the sensitivity analysis. So all the yeah, alternative actuarial assumptions should to some extent already be covered in the sensitivity analysis that we provide. So and, and, and to that extent, I would say that the, yeah, the sensitivity analysis would still be preferred to any alternative uh, way to, to, to report this measurement uncertainty. Thanks. And the, turning also the same question to, to Pierre Henry uh, to hear what you think. <laughs> All has still been said. I, I fully yeah. share what, what, what Lars explained, and it is uh, it has been also shared by uh, with our uh, 
actuarial experts and, uh, and human resources uh, uh, managers in charge of, of, of dealing with these topics. Sensitivity analysis is a useful tool for both uh, external communication and also internal management of these plans. So uh, we we are uh, we agree with with keeping this information, even if it's not required. We'll still continue to to provide it in uh, in our disclosures. Well, I think there's a clear message from the preparer side here regarding sensitivity analysis, regardless if it will be a mandatory disclosure requirement or not. So, but turning to Gert, then as as an actuary, do you think that sensitivity analysis should be provided, or are there better ways to explain? Uh, the portfolio. Yeah. I think uh, it's quite clear. I, I believe this is really, especially sensitivity on the discount rate, is very useful. Everybody is used to it. Uh, it's not very complicated to calculate. Actuaries use it as well to check their numbers. And I think it's the only way to, to, to check and to understand why the, the benefit obligations change this way or this way during the year. If there is one assumption that changes nearly every year, it is the discount rate. So to me, it's quite quite clear. Um, of course, when we talk about sensitivity analysis, to me, this is equivalent to the duration right? because both are, are the same. Um, I would maybe like to add that I think from an accounting perspective, one could argue that the benefit obligations are economically overstated because everybody has to discount its future benefit payments with a double A corporate bond yield. Economically, you could argue that discount rate should be the expected rate of return on the assets. Okay? The duration or sensitivity analysis does give users or an idea or enables them to get an idea of what would be the, what is the economic liability. Uh, maybe if I can turn to some other assumptions, uh, sensitivity analysis on salary increase that you could debate about. However, if we talk about information regarding uncertainty of the benefit obligations, a possibility could be that information is given by a breakdown of the benefit obligations between the portion related to accrued benefits today and the effect of future salary increases. Basically, the ABO, as we disclosed them under US GAAP. Okay. That I think is maybe more understandable or useful than a sensitivity on the salary increase. And then finally, I would just like to make a comment on the sensitivity. Frequently, companies give a sensitivity on the mortality assumption, assuming people live one year longer. Okay. There, I think, and the exposure draft does make people think a little bit, right? so that's a positive thing. Uh, in some countries, in most countries, you have standard mortality tables. But in some countries like the UK or the US, companies may have a specific mortality assumption. And there it might be useful to give, to give information what if they would use standard mortality uh, assumption rather than their company-specific one. Okay. So this is just a, a detailed, but an example of a possible uh, improvement and, and the opportunity that is offered to have a bit more flexibility. Thank you. Many thanks. From what we have heard here from, from both preparers and actuaries, there, there's a strong, strong, uh, strong positive view on, on providing sensitivity analysis information. So turning to, to Kazim then, to, it's interesting to hear from a user perspective, what do you think? Uh, about providing sensitivity analysis information. No, I think I absolutely agree. Um, and from sensitivity perspective, and I also agree with uh, Greed's uh, point uh, that expected rate of return should be there. But a mark of caution, because I think in, in U.S. public pensions, they actually have this requirement that you should use expected rate of return. And in certain public funds, what we noticed that there was a negative, there was a negative behavioral implication because what they started doing was they were starting investing in more aggressive um, portfolios to, to get the expected rate of return higher and then discount the liability. So there was a negative behavioral implication, but I, I do agree that um, that expected rate of return discount uh, will provide a very useful information, especially where we are now in, in the cycle. Um, I think from my perspective, if I go one step ahead, I would. it would also be helpful if the sensitivities are also 
um, streamlined. Like everyone uses similar basis points, uh, similar um, life expectancy, and on the same uh, me uh, measure, they, they provide sensitivity. I think that will be very helpful. Um, and I think um, uh, real, I think also it's not just the discount rate. I also, I think it's a real interest rate, like inflation also is, is, is a key um, assessment uh, that goes in. So, so inflation, uh, discount rate, longevity, expected rate of return, I would say like should be mandatory. Great, thanks. Um, Maren has her hand up. Please, Maren, to make a comment. Because it was just mentioned by, by Kazim and also the other participants regarding the expected return on plan assets, we don't agree on that, that this should be provided because we don't think that it's a, a useful information. It has a loss of judgment included, and um, therefore we, we don't agree with this. Um, and, and as I said, um, IS-19 has changed, yeah, and, and uh, with a revised version, and now we have the interest rate, which is used also for the plan assets, so the concept behind it has changed. So um, we, sh we agree that we should stick on that and not go back to something which, which has been there before. Uh, now we're getting into a heated discussion, so but I gave you a short reply from Kasim, and then we close that, that question. Please, Kasim. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I really, somebody has to tell me a good reason why they don't want to disclose expected rate of return. Because if you are buying your assets or you're changing your portfolio, it has to be some kind of a determination about expected rate of return. So why is it that information not being shared? Okay, point taken. We have different views on this. So uh, with that, I would like to move to, to another topic. Um, so uh, another question is that. Um, as you can observe from the proposal, there's only uh, specific disclosure requirements for, for defined benefit obligations. For other employee benefits, it's an overall disclosure objective. And the question is, do you think that that is enough or do you think that there should be more specific objectives for uh, defined contributions plan, for example? So I would like to, to hear from that. So I would turn to Lars first. Yeah, thanks, Klaus. So I think that indeed the nature of defined benefit obligations would indeed warrant these uh, specific disclosure uh, requirements. Huh? If we look to the, the, the measurement of the other uh, employee benefits, uh, including the, the defined contribution plans, then there is already uh, less uncertainty, which would also warrant less specific disclosure requirements. So hence, I would say that indeed for these other employee benefits, that generally overall disclosure objectives would be sufficient. A clear message. Uh, Pierre Henry, would you concur with uh, what Lars said, or do you think that you need more specific objectives? Yeah, yeah so generally I, I, I concur with, with what, what Lars said about these, uh, the objectives uh, on the other uh, employee benefits, but nevertheless, uh, when we, we discover the exposure draft uh, for preparing the field test, uh, of course, uh, for, for defined benefit plans, uh, it, it, it was logical to have so specific uh, objectives. And it is uh, uh, such plans are, are crucial issues for for for, for both preparers and users. But for the other plans, <clears throat> such as uh, defined contribution plans, which are quite significant in our countries, to have only a boilerplate uh, objectives. We, we, we find it a little bit short, and uh, we would have expected some more explanation about the user's need, except if they didn't have enough time to, to express their needs. And um, I don't know. I know why uh, uh, the, the, the objective is, is only uh, describe uh, the plans and, uh, and, uh, and its consequence and its uh, effect on the, on the primary financial statements because such objectives can be, uh, can be uh, presented for every type of, of transaction, every, every assets, every, every liabilities. So more generally preparing, I, I think that, pre that uh, with this new uh, disclosure approach, Prepare, uh, preparing the objectives with users will be a high challenge for ISB in the future when uh, when it will uh, it, it, it will uh, come to, to to new standards or to to the revision of, of currently existing standards. 
uh, it will be a high challenge in order to provide useful information for preparers for these objectives. If it's only uh, tell me uh, what is the operation and its effect on the uh, on the PNL and the balance sheet, it will not help us. Okay, a clear message. Uh, I'm turning to Niklas. Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, not pure questions. Okay. They, they are more remarks. Uh, and I can comment on one, one remark was that uh, yep. IS-19 already gives some flexibility with regards to the disclosures. So, so why aren't that flexibility used already? And I, I guess that, that depends on who is the given the disclosure. Because I, I assume that some companies use that flexibility, others do not. But, but, but I think it's a relevant comment as well, because when I first read the, the ED, uh, I considered that most of the objectives were not relevant. But then I saw the, on the following page that if not relevant, then disclose something else. So, so I think the, the ED is capturing the, the, the possibility to, to display what you consider to be the relevant disclosures almost a little bit more than what we found in the discussion on IRIS 13, I think. So, so, so for me, I, I think the ED is quite flexible with regards to adjusting for the different pen, pension plans. So, but, but, uh, so I think there are flexibility in the present and in, in the future. <laughs> Many thanks for that comment, Niklas. Uh, we're now drawing to, to the end of this uh, session and also the webinar, but I, I have one last uh, more general question that I would like to, to address to, to the panelists here. And, and this is the observation that, that IS-19 and IS-13 are, well, at least IS-19 is a very old standard, even though it's been revised. And, and, and also IS-13 actually now has some years on its, on its mileage. Um, they are there are somewhat old standards for which well-developed accounting practice now exists, of course. Uh, uh, the general question to the, to the panel is, do you think there will be a difference to apply uh, the new approach to new standards that are entirely new? And, and do you think that the should, proposed guidance should mainly be applied to, to new standards and not used as a guideline or guide, guidance for revising current standards? So with that, I would first turn to Lars. Thank you, Klaus. Yeah, I think that uh, that this uh, question really closes the circle that we have been uh, discussing here today. And the short answer would be obviously. Uh, uh, I mean, if I if I reflect on on our our first discussion, uh, I think that in general we identified little changes to our current disclosures based on the guidance and the exposure draft. No? If we are going to apply it to new standards, we probably yeah, look at these new disclosure requirements with fresh eyes and probably that will lead to different disclosures as we would have prepared when we would have indeed the, the stricter or more prescriptive disclosure requirements under the current standards. Nevertheless, I also think that it's then important to say that yeah, based on the discussions that we had today, that there should be some minimum disclosure requirements as well. Uh, to at least ensure some comparability across companies also in these new standards. Yeah. Thanks. And also turning to Marion to, to mm -hmm. ask the same question, and then I will let Karim in. Uh, fully, fully agree uh, to what Lars said. Yeah. So our, based on, on the discussions we had regarding uh, IFRS 13 and 19, also with our investor relations colleagues, so there, there are no questions regarding these disclosures that, so they, they receive from investors or analysts. And um, so I think also it's a good idea to start with new standards, um, have a fresh eye as Lars just pointed out, but as I, and still I'm in favor of a checklist or minimum requirements, whatever we call it. And, um, but having also the opportunity to to follow some objectives, have more entity specific disclosures, um, if needed. So, yeah, fully agree with what Lars said. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And turning last to Kazim to, to present his view on the, what you do. Should we have a complete overall of all the disclosure requirements, the current standards, or just apply them for the future? Um, no, I, I think it objectives, uh, having disclosure objectives, I think is, is helpful, um, irrespective. Uh, you apply to new standards or old standards, because also you need to consider it in a full um, cycle because there are other players as well. Uh, EFRG, um, LAB, 
FRC lab, they look at the good practices, they highlight that. So objectives will play a very useful part in connecting all those other aspects. So ESMA and FRC, they publish risk factors uh, on each cycles. So I think objectives will help and meet those how to be applied in, in practice. So I, I do think objectives is, is very helpful. It will cover an aspect of um, unexpected events or circumstances happening, how they, they should be captured and, and reflected. So I'm very much supportive of, of objectives coming in. Um, I think they will also help uh, improve the checklist as well, because uh, those objectives have to be linked with the mandatory checklist. But I agree with all the uh, speakers here that a minimum checklist has to be there. And, and you can have a dynamic approach. So every two, three year cycle, you review if there's some good practice coming in, users like it, put that in the mandatory checklist. And some from mandatory, if you think like now some disclosures are redundant, you take them out. Um, and I, I think that is uh, going forward will be helpful for everyone, uh, preparers, auditors, regulators, and users. Many thanks, Kasim, for, for your thoughts on that. And with that, I would like to now come to an end of the session by, by turning over the, the floor to Niklas, to, to the, so Niklas can provide his views and takeaways from this webinar. So please, Niklas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Klaus, and thank you for managing the time so perfectly as well. So, so, so I, I want to give a big thank you for all that have attended this important outreach and answer the polling question as well as the questions made in the chat. But, but an extra thank you to all the speakers and pan panelists and to Klaus for moderating this event. Uh, I have been on a lot of outreaches now and discussed this uh, for a really long time, but, but still, uh, I have really uh, appreciated that we, I have gotten some new information, new comments, new angles on the issues. Uh, so, so I'm really glad for that. Uh, but uh, I'm not kind of envy on the ISP trying to can conclude on this, because I think we can conclude that we, we, we have a lot of positive feedback on the general approach with objective-based disclosure requirements, and that's good. I, I did share that one. Uh, but, but, but in the details, we, we also have different views from some that consider a need for a more checklist approach, quotation mark, uh, while others see the value in less prospective disclosures and more freely objective based disclosures. So, so, so it's a need for ISP to try to reconcile on that in the end. Uh, and I also believe that, uh, as Catherine so well have explained, I, I think it might be some misinterpretations of certain angles also in the ED due to the wording and so on. So, so some conclusions with regards to the need for these checklist contra objective based approach may be have become different conclusions if if everyone fully have understood the intentions behind some of the objectives and some of the requirements as well. So, so I think that that's to, to Catherine to, to take away because even though it's have been a lot, several that are negative to, 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 to moving away from more detailed requirements, it might be a different conclusion if they fully understand the intention behind the objectives and so on. So, so not to be too, too disappointed with the comments received, I think. <laughs> but but um, I also have heard, and I really agree with that, that, that uh, to, to be have a successful inf implementation of the final standard, uh, needs that everyone put in their efforts from preparers, auditors, and forces, and others to, to really try to work together to achieve this new way of thinking, focusing more on materiality, even though it's in the standards already today. But 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 I think that the idea behind this is to even more have these unique relevant disclosures for each and every entity and a little bit less of checklists than have been the actual implementation today for, for some entities at least. But, but a big thank you to, to everyone, including the audience, for a really interesting hours here this Friday. Thank you. And with that, we will close the webinar for today. Thank you all for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.